Section 1 of The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath by Howard Phillips Lovecraft. This legomous recording may be distributed and adapted freely for any purpose. Read by Martin Rato. Part 1 Three times Randolph Carter dreamed of the marvelous city, and three times was he snatched away while still he paused on the high terrace above it. All golden and lovely it blazed in the sunset, with walls, temples, colonnades, and arched bridges of veined marble, silver basin fountains of prismatic spray and broad squares and perfumed gardens, and wide streets marching between delicate trees and blossom-laden urns and ivory statues in gleaming rows, while on steep northward slopes climbed tiers of red roofs and old peak gables harboring little lanes of grassy cobbles. It was a fever of the gods, a fanfare of supernal trumpets and a clash of immortal cymbals. Mystery hung about it as clouds about a fabulous unvisited mountain, and as Carter stood breathless and expectant on that balustrated parapet, there swept up to him the poignancy and suspense of almost vanished memory, the pain of lost things and the maddening need to place again what once had been an awesome and momentous place. He knew that for him its meaning must once have been supreme, though in what cycle or incarnation he had known it, or whether in dream or in waking, he could not tell. Vaguely it called up glimpses of a far-forgotten first youth, when wonder and pleasure lay in all the mystery of days, and dawn and dusk alike strode forth prophetic to the eager sound of lutes and song, unclosing fiery gates toward further and surprising marvels. But each night as he stood on that high marble terrace with the curious urns and carven rail, and looked off over that hushed sunset city of beauty and unearthly imminence, he felt the bondage of dream's tyrannous gods. For in no wise could he leave that lofty spot, or descend the wide marmorial flights flung endlessly down to where those streets of elder witchery lay outspread and beckoning. When for the third time he awakened with those flights still undescended and those hushed sunset streets still untraversed, he prayed long and earnestly to the hidden gods of dream that brood capricious above the clouds on unknown Kadath in the cold waste where no man treads. But the gods made no answer and showed no relenting nor did they give any favoring sign when he prayed to them in dream and invoked them sacrificially through the bearded priests of Nasht and Kamantha, whose carven temple with its pillar of flame lies not far from the gates of the waking world. It seemed, however, that his prayers must have been adversely heard, for after even the first of them he ceased wholly to behold the marvelous city, as if his three glimpses from afar had been mere accidents or oversights and against some hidden plan or wish of the gods. At length, sick with longing for those glittering sunset streets and cryptical hill lanes among ancient tiled roofs, nor able, sleeping or waking, to drive them from his mind, Carter resolved to go with bold entreaty whither no man had gone before, and dare the icy deserts through the dark to where unknown Kadath, veiled in cloud and crowned with unimagined stars, hold secret and nocturnal the onyx castle of the Great Ones. In light slumber he descended the seventy steps to the cavern of flame, and talked of his design to the bearded priests, Nasht and Kamantha. And the priests shook their shent-bearing heads and vowed it would be the death of his soul. They pointed out that the great ones had shown already their wish, and that it is not agreeable to them to be harassed by insistent pleas. 
They reminded him, too, that not only had no man ever been to Kadath, but no man had ever suspected in what part of space it may lie, whether it be in the dreamlands around our own world, or in those surrounding some unguessed companion of Fomalhaut or Aldebaran. If in our dreamland it might conceivably be reached, but only three human souls since time began had ever crossed and recrossed the black and pious gulfs to other dreamlands, and of that three, two had come back quite mad. There were in such voyages incalculable local dangers, as well as that shocking final peril which gibbers unmentionably outside the ordered universe where no dreams reach, that last amorphous blight of nethermost confusion which blasphemes and bubbles at the center of all infinity, the boundless demon sultan Azathoth, whose name no lips dare speak aloud, and who gnaws hungrily in inconceivable, unlighted chambers beyond time amidst the muffled, maddening beating of vile drums and the thin, monotonous whine of accursed flutes, to which detestable pounding and piping dance slowly, awkwardly, and absurdly the gigantic ultimate gods, the blind, voiceless, tenebrous, mindless other gods, whose soul and messenger is the crawling chaos near Lothota. Of these things was Carter warned by the priests Nasht and Kamantha in the cavern of flame, but still he resolved to find the gods on unknown Kadath in the cold waste, wherever that might be, and to win from them the sight and remembrance and shelter of the marvelous sunset city. He knew that his journey would be strange and long, and that the great ones would be against it, but being old in the land of dream, he counted on many useful memories and devices to aid him. So, asking a formal blessing of the priests and thinking shrewdly on his course, he boldly descended the seven hundred steps to the gate of deeper slumber and set out through the enchanted wood. In the tunnels of that twisted wood, whose low, prodigious oaks twine groping boughs and shine dim with the phosphorescence of strange fungi, dwell the furtive and secretive Zoogs, who know many obscure secrets of the dream world and a few of the waking world, since the wood at two places touches the lands of men, though it would be disastrous to say where, certain unexplained rumors, events, and vanishments occur among men where the Zoogs have access, and it is well that they cannot travel far outside the world of dreams. But over the nearer parts of the dream world they pass freely, flitting small and brown and unseen, and bearing back piquant tales to beguile the hours around their hearths in the forest they love. Most of them live in burrows, but some inhabit the trunks of the great trees, and although they live mostly on fungi, it is muttered that they've also a slight taste for meat, either physical or spiritual, for certainly many dreamers have entered that wood who have not come out. Carter, however, had no fear, for he was an old dreamer and had learned their fluttering language and made many a treaty with them. Having found through their help the splendid city of Selephis in Uthnargai, beyond the Tenarian hills, where reigns half the year the great king Kuranus, a man he had known by another name in life. Kuranus was the one soul who'd been to the star gulls and returned free from madness. Threading now the low phosphorescent aisles between those gigantic trunks, Carter made fluttering sounds in the manner of the Zoogs, and listened now and then for responses. He remembered one particular village of the creatures was in the center of the wood, where a circle of great mossy stones and what was once a clearing tells of older and more terrible dwellers long forgotten, and toward this spot he hastened. 
He traced his way by the grotesque fungi, which always seem better nourished as one approaches the dread circle where the elder beings danced and sacrificed. Finally, the great light of those thicker fungi revealed a sinister green and gray vastness, pushing up through the roof of the forest and out of sight. This was the nearest of the great ring of stones, and Carter knew he was close to the Zug village. Renewing his fluttering sound, he waited patiently, and was at last rewarded by an impression of many eyes watching him. It was the Zugs, for one sees their weird eyes long before one can discern their small, slippery brown outlines. Out they swarmed from hidden burrow and honeycomb tree, till the whole dim litten region was alive with them. Some of the wilder ones brushed Carter unpleasantly, and one even nipped loathsomely at his ear. But these lawless spirits were soon restrained by their elders. The council of sages, recognizing the visitor, offered a gourd of fermented sap from a haunted tree unlike the others, which had grown from a seed dropped down by someone on the moon. And as Carter drank it ceremoniously, a very strange colloquy began. The Zugs did not, unfortunately, know where the peak of Kadath lies, nor could they even say whether the cold waste is in our dream world or in another. Rumors of the Great Ones came equally from all points, and one might only say that they were likelier to be seen on high mountain peaks than in valleys, since on such peaks they dance reminiscently when the moon is above and the clouds beneath. Then one very ancient Zug recalled the thing unheard of by the others, and said that in Ulthar, beyond the river sky, there still lingered the last copy of those inconceivably old necotic manuscripts made by waking men in forgotten boreal kingdoms and born into the land of dreams when the hairy cannibal Gnofkase overcame many templed Olathoi and slew all the heroes of the land of Lomar. Those manuscripts, he said, told much of the gods, and besides, at Ulthar there were men who had seen the signs of the gods, and even one old priest who had scaled the great mountain to behold them dancing by moonlight. He had failed, though his companion had succeeded and perished namelessly. So Randolph Carter thanked the Zugs, who fluttered amicably and gave him another gourd of moon-tree wine to take with him, and set out through the phosphorescent wood for the other side, where the rushing sky flows down from the slopes of Larion, and Hatheg and Nir and Ulthar dot the plain. Behind him, furtive and unseen, crept several of the curious Zugs, for they wished to learn what might befall him, and bear back the legend to their people. The vast oaks grew thicker as he pushed on beyond the village, and he looked sharply for a certain spot where they would thin somewhat, standing quite dead or dying among the unnaturally dense fungi and the rotting mold and mushy logs of their fallen brothers. There he would turn sharply aside, for at that spot a mighty slab of stone rests on the forest floor, and those who have dared approach it say that it bears an iron ring three feet wide. Remembering the archaic circle of great mossy rocks and what it was possibly set up for, the Zugs do not pause near that expansive slab with its huge ring, for they realize that all which is forgotten need not necessarily be dead and they would not like to see the slab rise slowly and deliberately. Carter detoured at the proper place, and heard behind him the frightened fluttering of some of the more timid Zugs. He had known they would follow him, so he was not disturbed, for one grows accustomed to the anomalies of these prying creatures. It was twilight when he came to the edge of the wood, and the strengthening glow told him it was the twilight of morning. 
Over fertile plains rolling down to the sky, he saw the smoke of cottage chimneys, and on every hand were the hedges and ploughed fields and thatched roofs of a peaceful land. Once he stopped at a farmhouse well for a cup of water, and all the dogs barked affrightedly at the inconspicuous zoos that crept through the grass behind. At another house where people were stirring, he asked questions about the gods, and whether they danced often upon Lyrion. But the farmer and his wife would only make the elder sign, and tell him the way to Nier and Ulthar. At noon he walked through the one broad high street of Nier, which he had once visited and which marked his farthest former travels in this direction, and soon afterward he came to the great stone bridge across the sky, into whose central peace the masons had sealed the living human sacrifice when they built it thirteen hundred years before. Once on the other side, the frequent presence of cats, who all arched their backs at the trailing zoogs, revealed the near neighborhood of Ulthar, for in Ulthar, according to an ancient and significant law, no man may kill a cat. Very pleasant were the suburbs of Ulthar, with their little green cottages and neatly fenced farms, and still pleasanter was the quaint town itself, with its old peaked roofs and overhanging upper stories, and numberless chimney-pots and narrow hill streets, where one can see old cobbles whenever the graceful cats afford space enough. Carter, the cats being somewhat dispersed by the half-seen zoogs, picked his way directly to the modest temple of the elder ones, where the priests and old records were set to be, and once within that venerable circular tower of ivied stone, which crowns Ulthar's highest hill, he sought out the patriarch Atal who'd been up the forbidden peak Hathekya on the stony desert and had come down again alive. Atal, seated on an ivory dais in a festooned shrine at the top of the temple, was fully three centuries old, but still very keen of mind and memory. From him Carter learned many things about the gods, but mainly that they are indeed only Earth's gods, ruling feebly our own dreamland and having no power or habitation elsewhere. They might, Attell said, heed a man's prayer if in good humor, but one must not think of climbing to their onyx stronghold atop Kadath in the cold waste. It was lucky that no man knew where Kadath towers, for the fruits of ascending it would be very grave. Atal's companion, Barzai the Wise, had been drawn screaming into the sky for climbing merely the known peak of Hathekya. With unknown Kadath, if ever found, matters would be much worse, for although Earth's gods may sometimes be surpassed by a wise mortal, they are protected by the other gods from outside, whom it is better not to discuss. At least twice in the world's history, the other gods set their seal upon Earth's primal granite. Once in antediluvian times, as guessed from a drawing in those parts of the Picotic manuscripts too ancient to be read, and once on Hathekia, when Barzai the Wise tried to see Earth's gods dancing by moonlight. So, Atal said, it would be much better to let all gods alone, except in tactful prayers. Carter, though disappointed by Atal's discouraging advice and by the meager help to be found in the Pnecotic manuscripts and the seven cryptical books of Hassan, did not wholly despair. First he questioned the old priest about that marvelous sunset city seen from the railed terrace, thinking that perhaps he might find it without the god's aid. But Atal could tell him nothing. Probably, Atal said, the place belonged to his especial dream world and not to the general land of vision that many know, and conceivably it might be on another planet. 
In that case, Earth's gods could not guide him, if they would. But this was not likely, since the stopping of the dream showed pretty clearly that it was something the Great Ones wished to hide from him. And then Carter did a wicked thing, offering his guileless host so many drafts of the moon wine which the Zeus had given him that the old man became irresponsibly talkative. Robbed of his reserve, poor Rattel babbled freely of forbidden things, telling of a great image reported by travelers as carved on the solid rock of the mountain Negranic on the Isle of Oriab in the Southern Sea, and hinting that it may be a likeness which Earth's gods once wrought of their own features in the days when they danced by moonlight on that mountain. And he hiccuped, likewise, that the features of that image are very strange, so that one might easily recognize them, and that they are sure signs of the authentic race of the gods. Now, the use of all this in finding the gods became at once apparent to Carter. It is known that in disguise the younger among the great ones often espoused the daughters of men, so that around the borders of the cold waste wherein stands Kadath, the peasants must all bear their blood. This being so, the way to find that waste must be to see the stone faced on the granite and mark the features. Then, having noted them with care, to search for such features among living men. Where they are plainest and thickest, there must the gods dwell nearest, and whatever stony waste lies back of the villages in that place must be that wherein stands Kadath. Much of the great ones might be learned in such regions, and those with their blood might inherit little memories very useful to a seeker. They might not know their parentage, for the gods so dislike to be known among men that none can be found who has seen their faces wittingly, a thing which Carter realized even as he thought to scale Kadath. But they would have queer lofty thoughts misunderstood by their fellows, and would sing of far places and gardens so unlike any known even in the dreamland that common folk would call them fools. And from all this, one could perhaps learn old secrets of Kadath, or gain hints of the marvelous sunset city which the gods held secret. And more, one might in certain cases see some well-loved child of a god as hostage, or even capture some young god himself, disguised and dwelling amongst men with a comely peasant maiden as his bride. Atal, however, did not know how to find Nekranek on its isle of Oriab, and recommended that Carter follow the singing sky under its bridges down to the southern sea, where no Burgess of Ultar has ever been, but whence the merchants come in boats or with long caravans of mules and two-wheeled carts. There is a great city there, Dilathleen, but in Ulthar its reputation is bad because of the black three-banked galleys that sail to it with rubies from no clearly named shore. The traders that come from those galleys to deal with the jewelers are human, or nearly so, but the roars are never beheld, and it is not thought wholesome in Ulthar that merchants should trade with the black ships from unknown places whose roars cannot be exhibited. By the time he'd given this information, Atal was very drowsy, and Carter laid him gently on a couch of inlaid ebony and gathered his long beard decorously on his chest. As he turned to go, he observed that no suppressed fluttering followed him and wondered why the Zooks had become so lax in their curious pursuit. Then he noticed all the sleek, complacent cats of Ulthar licking their chops with unusual gusto, and recalled the spitting and caterwauling he'd faintly heard in lower parts of the temple, while absorbed in the old priest's conversation. He recalled, too, the evilly hungry way in which an especially impudent young Zug had regarded a small black kitten in the cobbled street outside. 
and because he loved nothing on earth more than small black kittens, he stooped and petted the sleek cats of Ultar as they licked their chops and did not mourn, because those inquisitive zoobs would escort him no farther. It was sunset now, so Carter stopped at an ancient inn on a steep little street overlooking the lower town. And as he went out on the balcony of his room and gazed down at the sea of red-tiled roofs and cobbled ways and the pleasant fields beyond, all mellow and magical in the slanted light, he swore that Ulthar would be a very likely place to dwell in always, were not the memory of a greater sunset city ever goading one onward toward unknown perils. And twilight fell, and the pink walls of the plastered gables turned violet and mystic, and little yellow lights floated up one by one from old lattice windows, and sweet bells pealed in the temple tower above, and the first star winked softly above the meadows across the sky. With the night came song, and Carter nodded as the lutenists praised ancient days from beyond the filigreed balconies and tessellated courts of simple Ulthar. And there might have been sweetness even in the voices of Ulthar's many cats, but that they were mostly heavy and silent from strange feasting. Some of them stole off to those cryptical realms which are known only to cats, and which villagers say are on the moon's dark side, whither the cats leap from tall housetops. But one small black kitten crept upstairs and sprang in Carter's lap to purr and play, and curled up near his feet when he lay down at last on the little couch whose pillows were stuffed with fragrant, drowsy herbs. In the morning, Carter joined a caravan of merchants bound for Dilathleen with the spun wool of Ulthar and the cabbages of Ulthar's busy farms. And for six days they rode with tinkling bells on the smooth road beside the sky, stopping some nights at the inns of little quaint fishing towns and on other nights camping under the stars while snatches of boatmen's songs came from the placid river. The country was very beautiful, with green hedges and groves, and picturesque peaked cottages and octagonal windmills. On the seventh day, a blur of smoke rose on the horizon ahead, and then the tall black towers of Dilathleen, which is built mostly of basalt. Dilathleen, with its thin angular towers, looks in the distance like a bit of the giant's causeway, and its streets are dark and uninviting. There are many dismal sea taverns near the myriad wharves, and all the town is thronged with the strange seamen of every land on earth, and of a few which are said to be not on earth. Carter questioned the oddly robed men of that city about the peak of Nekranek on the Isle of Oriab, and found that they knew of it well. Ships came from Baharna on that island, one being due to return thither in only a month, and Agronic is but two days' zebra ride from that port. But few had seen the stone face of the god, because it is on a very difficult side of Agronic, which overlooks only sheer crags and a valley of sinister lava. Once the gods were angered with men on that side and spoke of the matter to the other gods. It was hard to get this information from the traders and sailors in Dilatlin sea taverns because they mostly preferred to whisper of the black galleys. One of them was due in a week with rubies from its unknown shore, and the townsfolk dreaded to see it dock. The mouths of the men who came from it to trade were too wide and the way their turbans were humped up in two points above their foreheads was in especially bad taste, and their shoes were the shortest and queerest ever seen in the six kingdoms. But worst of all was the matter of the unseen roars, 
Those three banks of oars move too briskly and accurately and vigorously to be comfortable, and it was not right for a ship to stay in port for weeks while the merchants traded, yet to give no glimpse of its crew. It was not fair to the tavern keepers of Dilathleen or to the grocers and butchers either, for not a scrap of provisions was ever sent aboard. The merchants took only gold and stout black slaves from Parg across the river. That was all they ever took, those unpleasantly featured merchants and their unseen roars. Never anything from the butchers and grocers, but only gold and the fat black men of Parg, whom they bought by the pound. And the odors from those galleys which the south wind blew in from the wharves are not to be described. Only by constantly smoking strong thagweed could even the hardiest denizen of the old sea taverns bear them. Dilathleen would never have tolerated the black galleys had such rubies been obtainable elsewhere, but no mine in all earth's dreamland was known to produce their like. Of these things Dilathleen's cosmopolitan folk chiefly gossiped, whilst Carter waited patiently for the ship from Baharna, which might bear him to the isle whereon carven Negronic towers lofty and barren. Meanwhile he did not fail to seek through the haunts of far travellers for any tales they might have concerning Kadat and the Cold Waste, or a marvellous city of marble walls and silver fountains seen below terraces in the sunset. Of these things, however, he learned nothing, though he once thought that a certain old slant-eyed merchant looked queerly intelligent when cold waste was spoken of. This man was reputed to trade with the horrible stone villages on the icy desert plateau of Lang, which no healthy folk visit and whose evil fires are seen at night from afar. He was even rumored to have dealt with that high priest not to be described, which wears a yellow silken mask over its face and dwells all alone in a prehistoric stone monastery. That such a person might well have had nibbling traffic with such beings as may conceivably dwell in the cold waste was not to be doubted, but Carter soon found that it was no use questioning him. End of part one. Section two of the Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath by Howard Phillips Lovecraft. This legomus recording may be distributed and adapted freely for any purpose. Read by Martin Rato. Part two. Then the black galley slipped into the harbor past the basalt whale and the tall lighthouse, silent and alien, and with a strange stench that the south wind drove into the town. Uneasiness rustled through the taverns along that waterfront, and after a while the dark, wide-mouthed merchants with humped turbans and short feet clumped stealthily ashore to seek the bazaars of the jewelers. Harter observed them closely and disliked them more the longer he looked at them. Then he saw them drive the stout black men of Parg up the gangplank, grunting and sweating into that singular galley, and wondered in what lands or if in any lands at all, those fat, pathetic creatures might be destined to serve. And on the third evening of that galley's stay, one of the uncomfortable merchants spoke to him, smirking sinfully and hinting of what he had heard in the taverns of Carter's guest. He appeared to have knowledge too secret for public telling, and although the sound of his voice was unbearably hateful, Carter felt that the lore of so far a traveller must not be overlooked. He bade him, therefore, to be his guest in locked chambers above, and drew out the last of the Zug's moonwine to loosen his tongue. The strange merchant drank heavily, but smirked unchanged by the draught. 
Then he drew forth a curious bottle with wine of his own, and Carter saw that the bottle was a single hollowed ruby, grotesquely carved in patterns too fabulous to be comprehended. He offered his wine to his host, and though Carter took only the least sip, he felt the dizziness of space and the fever of unimagined jungles. All the while the guest had been smiling more and more broadly, and as Carter slipped into blankness, the last thing he saw was that dark, odious face convulsed with evil laughter and something quite unspeakable, where one of the two frontal puffs of that orange turban had become disarranged with the shakings of that epileptic mirth. Carter next had consciousness amidst horrible odors, beneath a tent-like awning on the deck of a ship, with the marvelous coasts of the southern sea flying by in unnatural swiftness. He was not chained, but three of the dark sardonic merchants stood grinning nearby, and the sight of those humps in their turbans made him almost as faint as did the stench that filtered up through the sinister hatches. He saw slip past him the glorious lands and cities of which a fellow dreamer of earth a lighthouse keeper in ancient Kingsport had often discoursed in the old days and recognized the temple terraces of Zack, abode of forgotten dreams, the spires of infamous Thalarion, that demon city of a thousand wonders where the Eidolon Lathi reigns, the charnel gardens of Zura, land of pleasures unattained, and the twin headlands of crystal meeting above in a resplendent arch which guard the harbor of Sona Nil, blessed land of fancy. Past all these gorgeous lands, the malodorous ship flew unwholesomely, urged by the abnormal strokes of those unseen roars below. And before the day was done, Carter saw that the steersman could have no other goal than the basalt pillars of the West, beyond which simple folk say splendid Cathuria lies, but which wise dreamers well know are the gates of a monstrous cataract, wherein the oceans of Earth's dreamland drop wholly to abysmal nothingness and shoot through the empty spaces toward other worlds and other stars and the awful voids outside the ordered universe where the demon Sultan Azathoth gnaws hungrily in chaos amid pounding and piping and the hellish dancing of the other gods, blind, voiceless, tenebrous and mindless with their soul and messenger Nyarlathotep. Meanwhile, the three sardonic merchants would give no word of their intent, though Carter well knew that they must be leagued with those who wished to hold him from his quest. It is understood in the land of dream that the other gods have many agents moving among men, and all these agents, whether wholly human or slightly less than human, are eager to work the will of those blind and mindless things in return for the favor of their hideous soul and messenger, the crawling chaos, Nearlithotep. So Carter inferred that the merchants of the humped turbans, hearing of his daring search for the great ones in their castle of Kadath, had decided to take him away and deliver him to Nearlithotep for whatever nameless bounty might be offered for such a prize. What might be the land of those merchants in our known universe or in the eldritch spaces outside? Carter could not guess, nor could he imagine at what hellish trysting place they would meet the crawling chaos to give him up and claim their reward. He knew, however, that no beings as nearly human as these would dare approach the ultimate knighted throne of the demon Azathoth in the formless central void. At the set of sun, the merchants licked their excessively wide lips and glared hungrily, and one of them went below and returned from some hidden and offensive cabin with a pot and basket of plates. 
Then they squatted close together beneath the awning and ate the smoking meat that was passed around. But when they gave Carter a portion, he found something very terrible in the size and shape of it, so that he turned even paler than before and cast that portion into the sea when no eye was on him. And again he thought of those unseen roars beneath and of the suspicious nourishment from which their far too mechanical strength was derived. It was dark when the galley passed betwixt the basalt pillars of the west, and the sound of the ultimate cataract swelled portentous from ahead, and the spray of that cataract rose to obscure the stars, and the deck grew damp, and the vessel reeled in the surging current of the brink. Then with a queer whistle and plunge the leap was taken, and Carter felt the terrors of nightmare as earth fell away and the great boat shot silent and comet-like into planetary space. Never before had he known what shapeless black things lurk and caper and flounder all through the ether, leering and grinning at such voyagers as may pass and sometimes feeling about with slimy paws when some moving object excites their curiosity. These are the nameless larvae of the other gods, and like them are blind and without mind, and possessed of singular hungers and thirsts. But that offensive galley did not aim as far as Carter had feared, for he soon saw that the helmsman was steering a course directly for the moon. The moon was a crescent shining larger and larger as they approached it, and showing its singular craters and peaks uncomfortably. The ship made for the edge, and it soon became clear that its destination was that secret and mysterious side which is always turned away from earth and which no fully human person, save perhaps the dreamer Sneereth Ko, has ever beheld. The close aspect of the moon as the galley drew near proved very disturbing to Carter, and he did not like the size and shape of the ruins which crumbled here and there. The dead temples on the mountains were so placed that they could have glorified no suitable or wholesome gods and in the symmetries of the broken columns there seemed to be some dark and inner meaning which did not invite solution. And what the structure and proportions of the olden worshippers could have been, Carter steadily refused to conjecture. When the ship rounded the edge and sailed over those lands unseen by man, there appeared in the queer landscape certain signs of life, and Carter saw many low, broad, round cottages and fields of grotesque, whitish fungi. He noticed that these cottages had no windows, and thought that their shape suggested the huts of Eskimos. Then he glimpsed the oily waves of a sluggish sea, and knew that the voyage was once more to be by water, or at least through some liquid. The galley struck the surface with a peculiar sound, and the odd, elastic way the waves received it was very perplexing to Carter. They now slid along at great speed, once passing and hailing another galley of kindred form, but generally seeing nothing but that curious sea and a sky that was black and star-strewn, even though the sun shone scorchingly in it. There presently rose ahead the jagged hills of a leprous-looking coast, and Carter saw the thick, unpleasant gray towers of a city. The way they leaned and bent, the manner in which they were clustered, and the fact that they had no windows at all was very disturbing to the prisoner, and he bitterly mourned the folly which had made him sip the curious wine of that merchant with the hump turban. As the coast drew nearer and the hideous stench of that city grew stronger, he saw upon the jagged hills many forests, some of whose trees he recognized as akin to that solitary moon tree in the enchanted wood of earth, from whose sap the small brown zoogs ferment their curious wine. 
Carter could now distinguish moving figures on the noisome wharves ahead, and the better he saw them, the worse he began to fear and detest them, for they were not men at all, or even approximately men, but great grayish-white slippery things which could expand and contract at will, and whose principal shape, though it often changed, was that of a sort of toad without any eyes, but with a curious vibrating mass of short pink tentacles on the end of its blunt, vague snout. These objects were waddling busily about the wharves, moving bales and crates and boxes with preternatural strength, and now and then hopping on or off some anchored galley with long oars in their forepaws, and now and then one would appear driving a herd of clumping slaves, which indeed were approximate human beings with wide mouths like those merchants who traded in Dilathleen. Only these herds, being without turbans or shoes or clothing, did not seem so very human after all. Some of the slaves, the fatter ones, whom a sort of overseer would pinch experimentally, were unloaded from ships and nailed in crates which workers pushed into the low warehouses or loaded on great lumbering vans. Once a van was hitched and driven off, and the fabulous thing which drew it was such that Carter gasped, even after having seen the other monstrosities of that hateful place. Now and then a small herd of slaves dressed in turban like the dark merchants would be driven aboard a galley, followed by a great crew of the slippery toad things as officers, navigators, and roars. And Carter saw that the almost human creatures were reserved for the more ignominious kinds of servitude which required no strength such as steering and cooking, fetching and carrying, and bargaining with men on the earth or other planets where they traded. These creatures must have been convenient on earth, for they were truly not unlike men when dressed and carefully shod and turbaned, and could haggle in the shops of men without embarrassment or curious explanations. But most of them, unless lean or ill-favored, were unclothed, and packed in crates, and drawn off in lumbering lorries by fabulous things. Occasionally other beings were unloaded and crated, some very like these semi-humans, some not so similar, and some not similar at all. And he wondered if any of the poor stout black men of Parg were left to be unloaded and crated and shipped inland in those obnoxious drays. When the galley landed at a greasy-looking quay of spongy rock, a nightmare horde of toad things wiggled out of the hatches, and two of them seized Carter and dragged him ashore. The smell and aspect of that city are beyond telling, and Carter held only scattered images of the tiled streets and black doorways and endless precipices of gray vertical walls without windows. At length he was dragged within a low doorway and made to climb infinite steps in pitch blackness. It was apparently all one to the toad things, whether it were light or dark. The odor of the place was intolerable, and when Carter was locked into a chamber and left alone, he scarcely had strength to crawl around and ascertain his form and dimensions. It was circular and about twenty feet across. From then on, time ceased to exist. At intervals, food was pushed in, but Carter would not touch it. What his fate would be, he did not know, but he felt that he was held for the coming of that frightful soul and messenger of infinity's other gods, the crawling chaos de Arlathotep. Finally, after an unguessed span of hours or days, the great stone door swung wide again, and Carter was shoved down the stairs and out into the red-lit streets of that fearsome city. It was night on the moon, and all through the town were stationed slaves bearing torches. In a detestable square, a sort of procession was formed. Ten of the toad things and twenty-four almost human torch-bearers, eleven on either side, 
and one each before and behind. Carter was placed in the middle of the line, five towed things ahead and five behind, and one almost human torch-bearer on either side of him. Certain of the toad things produced disgustingly carven flutes of ivory and made loathsome sounds. To that hellish piping, the column advanced out of the tiled streets and into the nighted plains of obscene fungi, soon commencing to climb one of the lower and more gradual hills that lay behind the city. That on some frightful slope or blasphemous plateau, the crawling chaos waited... Carter could not doubt, and he wished that the suspense might soon be over. The whining of those impious flutes was shocking, and he would have given worlds for some even half-normal sound, but these toad things had no voices, and the slaves did not talk. Then, through that star-specked darkness, there did come a normal sound. It rolled from the higher hills, and from all the jagged peaks around it was caught up and echoed in a swelling, pandemoniac chorus. It was the midnight yell of the cat. And Carter knew at last that the old village folk were right when they made low guesses about the cryptical realms which are known only to cats, and to which the elders among cats repair by stealth nocturnally, springing from high housetops. Verily, it is to the moon's dark side that they go to leap and gamble on the hills and converse with ancient shadows, and there amidst that column of fetid things Carter heard their homely, friendly cry, and thought of the steep roofs and warm hearths and little lighted windows of home. Now much of the speech of cats was known to Randolph Carter, and in this far terrible place he uttered the cry that was suitable. But that he need not have done, for even as his lips opened he heard the chorus wax and draw nearer, and saw swift shadows against the stars as small, graceful shapes leaped from hill to hill in gathering legions. The call of the clan had been given, and before the foul procession had time even to be frightened, a cloud of smothering fur and a phalanx of murderous claws were tidily and tempestuously upon it. The flute stopped, and there were shrieks in the night. Dying, almost humans screamed, and cats spit and yowled and roared. But the toad things made never a sound, as their stinking green ichor oozed fatally upon that porous earth with the obscene fungi. It was a stupendous sight while the torches lasted, and Carter had never before seen so many cats, black, gray, and white, yellow, tiger, and mixed, common, Persian, and Merix, Tibetan, Angora, and Egyptian. All were there in the fury of battle, and there hovered over them some trace of that profound and inviolate sanctity which made their goddess great in the temples of Bubastis. They would leap seven strong at the throat of an almost human or the pink tentacled snout of a toad thing, and drag it down savagely to the fungus plain, where myriads of their fellows would surge over it and into it with the frenzied claws and teeth of a divine battle fury. Carter had seized the torch from a stricken slave, but was soon overborne by the surging waves of his loyal defenders. Then he lay in the utter blackness, hearing the clangor of war and the shouts of the victors, and feeling the soft paws of his friends as they rushed to and fro over him in the fray. At last awe and exhaustion closed his eyes, and when he opened them again it was upon a strange scene, the great shining disk of the earth, thirteen times greater than that of the moon as we see it, had risen with floods of weird light over the lunar landscape, 
and across all those leagues of wild plateaus and ragged crest there squatted one endless sea of cats in orderly array. Circle on circle they reached, and two or three leaders out of the ranks were licking his face and purring to him consolingly. Of the dead slaves and toad things there were not many signs, but Carter thought he saw one bone a little way off in the open space between him and the warriors. Carter now spoke with the leaders in the soft language of cats, and learned that his ancient friendship with the species was well known and often spoken of in the places where cats congregate. He had not been unmarked in Ulthar when he passed through, and the sleek old cats had remembered how he patted them after they had attended to the hungry zoogs who looked evilly at a small black kitten. And they recalled, too, how he had welcomed the very little kitten who came to see him at the inn, and how he'd given it a saucer of rich cream in the morning before he left. The grandfather of that very little kitten was the leader of the army now assembled, for he had seen the evil procession from a far hill and recognized the prisoner as a sworn friend of his kind on earth and in the land of dream. A yowl now came from the farther peak, and the old leader paused abruptly in his conversation. It was one of the army's outposts, stationed on the highest of the mountains, to watch for the one foe which Earth's cats fear, the very large and peculiar cats from Saturn, who for some reason have not been oblivious of the charm of our moon's dark side. They are leagued by treaty with the evil toad things, and are notoriously hostile to our earthly cats, so that at this juncture a meeting would have been a somewhat grave matter. After a brief consultation of generals, the cats rose and assumed a closer formation, crowding protectingly around Carter and preparing to take the great leap through a space back to the housetops of our earth and its dreamland. The old field marshal advised Carter to let himself be borne along smoothly and passively in the massed ranks of furry leapers, and told him how to spring when the rest sprang and land gracefully when the rest landed. He also offered to deposit him in any spot he desired, and Carter decided on the city of Dilathleen, whence the black galley had set out, for he wished to sail thence for Oriab and the carven crest Granic, and also to warn the people of the city to have no more traffic with black galleys, if, indeed, that traffic could be tactfully and judiciously broken off. Then, upon a signal, the cats all leaped gracefully with their friend packed securely in their midst, while in a black cave on an unhallowed summit of the moon mountains, still vainly waited the crawling chaos near Lothotep. The leap of the cats through space was very swift, and being surrounded by his companions, Carter did not see this time the great black shapelessnesses that lurk and caper and flounder in the abyss. Before he fully realized what had happened, he was back in his familiar room at the inn at Dilathleen, and the stealthy, friendly cats were pouring out of the window in streams. The old leader from Ulthar was the last to leave, and as Carter shook his paw, he said he would be able to get home by cockcrow. When dawn came, Carter went downstairs and learned that a week had elapsed since his capture and leaving. There was still nearly a fortnight to wait for the ship bound toward Oriab, and during that time he said what he could against the black galleys and their infamous ways. Most of the townsfolk believed him, yet so fond were the jewelers of the great rubies that none would wholly promise to cease trafficking with the wide-mouthed merchants. If aught of evil ever befalls Dilath lean through such traffic, it will not be his fault. In about a week the desiderate ship put in by the black whale and tall lighthouse, and Carter was glad to see that she was a bark of wholesome men, 
with painted sides and yellow lateen sails and a gray captain in silken robes. Her cargo was a fragrant resin of Oriab's inner groves, and the delicate pottery baked by the artists of Baharna, and the strange little figures carved from Ingranic's ancient lava. For this they were paid in the wool of Ulthar, and the iridescent textiles of Hatheg, and the ivory that the black men carve across the river in Parg. Carter made arrangements with the captain to go to Baharna, and was told that the voyage would take ten days, and during his week of waiting he talked much with that captain of Negronic, and was told that very few had seen the carven face thereon, but that most travelers are content to learn its legends from old people and lava gatherers and image makers in Baharna, and afterwards say in their far homes that they have indeed beheld it. The captain was not even sure that any person now living had beheld that carven face, for the wrong side of Negronic is very difficult and barren and sinister, and there are rumors of caves near the peak wherein dwell the night gods. But the captain did not wish to say just what a night god might be like, since such cattle are known to haunt most persistently the dreams of those who think too often of them. Then Carter asked that captain about unknown Kadath in the cold waste and the marvelous Sunset City, but of these the good man could truly tell nothing. Carter sailed out of Delathleen one early morning when the tide turned and saw the first rays of sunrise on the thin angular towers of that dismal basalt town and for two days they sailed eastward in sight of green coasts and saw often the pleasant fishing towns that climbed up steeply with their red roofs and chimney pots from old dreaming wharves and beaches where nets lay drying but on the third day they turned sharply south where the roll of water was stronger and soon passed from sight of any land on the fifth day the sailors were nervous but the captain apologized for their fears, saying that the ship was about to pass over the weedy walls and broken columns of a sunken city too old for memory, and that when the water was clear one could see so many moving shadows in that deep place that simple folk disliked it. He admitted, moreover, that many ships had been lost in that part of the sea, having been hailed when quite close to it, but never seen again. That night the moon was very bright, and one could see a great way down in the water. There was so little wind that the ship could not move much, and the ocean was very calm. Looking over the rail, Carter saw many fathoms deep the dome of the great temple, and in front of it an avenue of unnatural sphinxes leading to what was once a public square. Dolphins sported merrily in and out of the ruins, and porpoises reveled clumsily here and there, sometimes coming to the surface and leaping clear out of the sea. As the ship drifted on a little, the floor of the ocean rose in hills, and one could clearly mark the lines of ancient climbing streets and the washed-down walls of myriad little houses. Then the suburbs appeared, and finally a great lone building on a hill of simpler architecture than the other structures, and in much better repair. It was dark and low and covered four sides of a square, with a tower at each corner, a paved court in the center, and small curious round windows all over it. Probably it was of basalt, though weeds draped the greater part. And such was its lonely and impressive place on that far hill that it may have been a temple or a monastery. Some phosphorescent fish inside it gave the small round windows an aspect of shining, and Carter did not blame the sailors much for their fears. Then by the watery moonlight he noticed an odd high monolith in the middle of that central court and saw that something was tied to it and when after getting a telescope from the captain's cabin he saw that bound thing was a sailor in the silk robes of Oriab, 
head downward and without any eyes. He was glad that a rising breeze soon took the ship ahead to more healthy parts of the sea. End of Part 2 Section 3 of The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath by Howard Phillips Lovecraft. This Thagamist recording may be distributed and adapted freely for any purpose. Read by Martin Rato. Part 3 The next day they spoke with a ship with violet sails bound for Tsar, in the land of forgotten dreams with bulbs of strange colored lilies for cargo. And on the evening of the eleventh day they came in sight of the Isle of Oriab, with Ngranic rising jagged and snow-crowned in the distance. Oriab is a very great isle, and its port of Baharna a mighty city. The forbs of Baharna are of porphyry, and the city rises in great stone terraces behind them, having streets of steps that are frequently arched over by buildings and the bridges between buildings. There is a great canal which goes under the whole city in a tunnel with granite gates and leads to the inland lake of Yath, on whose farther shore are the vast clay-brick ruins of a primal city whose name is not remembered. As the ship drew into the harbor at evening, the twin beacons Thon and Thal gleamed a welcome, and in all the million windows of Baharna's terraces, mellow lights peeped out quietly and gradually as the stars peep out overhead in the dusk, till that steep and climbing seaport became a glittering constellation hung between the stars of heaven and the reflections of those stars in the still harbor. The captain, after landing, made Carter a guest in his own small house on the shores of Yath, where the rear of the town slopes down to it, and his wife and servants brought strange, toothsome foods for the traveler's delight. And in the days after that, Carter asked for rumors and legends of Ngranic and all the taverns and public places where lava gatherers and image makers meet but could find no one who had been up the higher slopes or seen the carven face. Ngranic was a hard mountain with only an accursed valley behind it, and besides, one could never depend on the certainty that night gaunts are altogether fabulous. When the captain sailed back to Dilathleen, Carter took quarters in an ancient tavern opening on an alley of steps in the original part of the town, which is built of brick and resembles the ruins of Yath's farther shore. Here he laid his plans for the ascent of Negronic, and correlated all that he learned from the lava gatherers about the roads thither. The keeper of the tavern was a very old man, and had heard so many legends that he was a great help. He even took Carter to an upper room in that ancient house, and showed him a crude picture which a traveller had scratched on the clay wall in the old days, when men were bolder and less reluctant to visit Ngranic's higher slopes. The old tavern-keeper's great-grandfather had heard from his great-grandfather that the traveller who scratched that picture had climbed Ngranic and seen the carven face, here drawing it for others to behold. But Carter had very great doubts, since the large, rough features on the wall were hasty and careless, and wholly overshadowed by a crowd of little companion shapes in the worst possible taste, with horns and wings and claws and curling tails. At last, having gained all the information he was likely to gain in the taverns and public places of Baharna, Carter hired a zebra and set out one morning on the road by Yath shore, for those inland parts wherein towers stony and granic. On his right were rolling hills and pleasant orchards and neat little stone farmhouses, 
and he was much reminded of those fertile fields that flank the sky. By evening he was near the nameless ancient ruins on Yath's farther shore, and though old lava gatherers had warned him not to camp there at night, he tethered his zebra to a curious pillar before a crumbling wall, and laid his blanket in a sheltered corner beneath some carvings whose meaning none could decipher. Around him he wrapped another blanket, for the nights are cold in Oriab, and when upon waking once he thought he felt the wings of some insect brushing his face, he covered his head altogether and slept in peace, till roused by the Maga birds in distant resin groves. The sun had just come up over the great slope whereon leagues of primal brick foundations and worn walls and occasional cracked pillars and pedestals stretched down desolate to the shores of Yath, and Carter looked about for his tethered zebra. Great was his dismay to see that docile beast stretch prostrate beside the curious pillar to which it had been tied, and still greater was he vexed on finding that the steed was quite dead, with its blood all sucked away through a singular wound in its throat. His pack had been disturbed, and several shiny knick-knacks taken away. All round on the dusty soil were great wet footprints for which he could not in any way account. The legends and warnings of lava gatherers occurred to him, and he thought of what had brushed his face in the night. Then he shouldered his pack and strode on toward Ngranic, though not without a shiver, when he saw close to him as the highway passed through the ruins a great gaping arch low in the wall of an old temple, with steps leading down into darkness farther than he could peer. His course now lay uphill, through wilder and partly wooded country, and he saw only the huts of charcoal burners and the camp of those who gathered resin from the groves. The whole air was fragrant with balsam, and all the maga birds sang blithely as they flashed their seven colors in the sun. Near sunset he came upon a new camp of lava gatherers returning with laden sacks from Granik's lower slopes, and here he also camped, listening to the songs and tales of the men, and overhearing what they whispered about a companion they had lost. He had climbed high to reach a mass of fine lava above him, and at nightfall did not return to his fellows. When they looked for him the next day they found only his turban, nor was there any sign on the crags below that he had fallen. They did not search any more, because the old man among them said it would be of no use. No one ever found what the night gaunts took, though those beasts themselves were so uncertain as to be almost fabulous. Carter asked them if night gaunts sucked blood, and light shiny things, and left webbed footprints. But they all shook their heads negatively, and seemed frightened at his making such an inquiry. When he saw how taciturn they'd become, he asked them no more, but went to sleep in his blanket. The next day he rose with the lava gatherers and exchanged farewells, as they rode west and he rode east on a zebra he bought of them. Their older men gave him blessings and warnings, and told him he'd better not climb too high on Granik, but while he thanked them heartily he was in no wise dissuaded for still did he feel that he must find the gods on unknown Kadath, and win from them a way to that haunting and marvelous city in the sunset. By noon, after a long uphill ride, he came upon some abandoned brick villages of the hill people, who had once dwelt thus close to Ingranic, and carved images from its smooth lava. Here they had dwelt till the days of the old tavern-keeper's grandfather, but about that time they felt that their presence was disliked. Their homes had crept even up the mountain slope, and the higher they built, the more people they would miss when the sun rose. At last they decided it would be better to leave altogether, since things were sometimes glimpsed in the darkness which no one could interpret favorably. So in the end all of them went down to the sea and dwelt in Baharna, 
inhabiting a very old quarter and teaching their sons the old art of image-making, which to this day they carry on. It was from these children of the exiled hill people that Carter had heard the best tales about Engranic when searching through Baharna's ancient taverns. All this time the great gaunt side of Ngranic was looming up higher and higher as Carter approached it. There were sparse trees on the lower slopes and feeble shrubs above them, and then the bare, hideous rock rose spectral into the sky to mix with frost and ice and eternal snow. Carter could see the rifts and ruggedness of that somber stone, and did not welcome the prospect of climbing it. In places there were solid streams of lava and scoriac heaps that littered slopes and ledges. Ninety aeons ago, before even the gods had danced upon its pointed peak, that mountain had spoken with fire and roared with the voices of the inner thunders. Now it towered all silent and sinister, bearing on the hidden side that secret titan image whereof rumor told. And there were caves in that mountain which might be empty and alone with elder darkness, or might, if legends spoke truly, hold horrors of a form not to be surmised. The ground sloped upward to the foot of Ngranic, thinly covered with scrub oaks and ash trees, and strewn with bits of rock, lava, and ancient cinder. There were the charred embers of many camps, where the lava gatherers were wont to stop, and several rude altars which they built either to propitiate the great ones, or to ward off what they dreamed of in Engranic's high passes and labyrinthine caves. At evening, Carter reached the farthermost pile of embers and camped for the night, tethering his zebra to a sapling and wrapping himself well in his blankets before going to sleep. And all through the night, a vooneth howled distantly from the shore of some hidden pool. But Carter felt no fear of that amphibious terror, since he'd been told with certainty that not one of them dares even approach the slope of Ngranic. In the clear sunshine of morning, Carter began the long ascent, taking his zebra as far as that useful beast could go, but tying it to a stunted ash tree when the floor of the thin wood became too steep. Thereafter he scrambled up alone, first through the forest with its ruins of old villages and overgrown clearings, and then over the tough grass where anemic shrubs grew here and there. He regretted coming clear of the trees since the slope was very precipitous and the whole thing rather dizzying. At length he began to discern all the countryside spread out beneath him whenever he looked about. The deserted huts of the image-makers, the groves of resin trees and the camps of those who gathered from them, the woods where prismatic magas nest and sing, and even a hint very far away of the shores of Yath and of those forbidding ancient ruins whose name is forgotten. He found it best not to look around and kept on climbing and climbing till the shrubs became very sparse and there was often nothing but the tough grass to cling to. Then the soil became meager, with great patches of bare rock cropping out, and now and then the nest of a condor in a crevice. Finally there was nothing at all but the bare rock, and had it not been very rough and weathered, he could scarcely have ascended farther. Knobs, ledges, and pinnacles, however, helped greatly, and it was cheering to see occasionally the sign of some lava gatherer scratch clumsily in the friable stone, and know that wholesome human creatures had been there before him. After a certain height the presence of man was further shown by handholds and footholds hewn where they were needed and by little quarries and excavations where some choice vein or stream of lava had been found. In one place a narrow ledge had been chopped artificially to an especially rich deposit far to the right of the main line of ascent. 
Once or twice, Carter dared to look around and was almost stunned by the spread of landscape below. All the island betwixt him and the coast lay open to his sight, with Baharna's stone terraces and the smoke of its chimneys mystical in the distance, and beyond that the illimitable southern sea with all its curious secrets. Thus far there had been much winding around the mountain, so that the farther and carven side was still hidden. Carter now saw a ledge running upward and to the left, which seemed to head the way he wished, and this course he took in the hope that it might prove continuous. After ten minutes he saw it was indeed no cul-de-sac, but that it led steeply on in an arc which would, unless suddenly interrupted or deflected, bring him after a few hours climbing to that unknown southern slope overlooking the desolate crags and the accursed valley of lava. As new country came into view below him, he saw that it was bleaker and wilder than those seaward lands he had traversed. The mountain side, too, was somewhat different, being here pierced by curious cracks and caves not found on the straighter route he'd left. Some of these were above him and some beneath him, all opening on sheerly perpendicular cliffs and wholly unreachable by the feet of man. The air was very cold now, but so hard was the climbing that he did not mind it. Only the increasing rarity bothered him, and he thought that perhaps it was this which had turned the heads of other travellers and excited those absurd tales of night gaunts whereby they explained the loss of such climbers as fell from these perilous paths. He was not much impressed by travelers' tales, but had a good curved scimitar in case of any trouble. All lesser thoughts were lost in the wish to see that carven face which might set him on the track of the gods atop unknown Kadath. At last, in the fearsome iciness of upper space, he came round fully to the hidden side of Ngranic and saw in infinite gulfs below him the lesser crags and sterile abysses of lava which marked olden wrath of the Great Ones. There was unfolded, too, a vast expanse of country to the south, but it was a desert land without fair fields or cottage chimneys and seemed to have no ending. No trace of the sea was visible on this side, for Oriab is a great island. Black caverns and odd crevices were still numerous on the sheer vertical cliffs, but none of them was accessible to a climber. There now loomed aloft a great beetling mass which hampered the upward view, and Carter was for a moment shaken with doubt lest it prove impassable. Poised in windy insecurity miles above earth, with only space and death on one side and only slippery walls of rock on the other, he knew for a moment the fear that makes men shun Agronic's hidden side. He could not turn around, yet the sun was already low. If there were no way aloft, the night would find him crouching there still, and the dawn would not find him at all. But there was a way, and he saw it in due season. Only a very expert dreamer could have used those imperceptible footholds, yet to Carter they were sufficient. Surmounting now the outward hanging rock, he found the slope above much easier than that below, since the great glaciers melting had left a generous space with loam and ledges. To the left a precipice dropped straight from unknown heights to unknown depths, with a cave's dark mouth just out of reach above him. Elsewhere, however, the mountain slanted back strongly and even gave him space to lean and rest. He felt from the chill that he must be near the snow line and looked up to see what glittering pinnacles might be shining in that late ruddy sunlight. Surely enough, there was the snow uncounted thousands of feet above and below it a great beetling crag like that he had just climbed, hanging there forever in bold outline. 
And when he saw that crag, he gasped and cried out aloud and clutched at the jagged rock in awe, for the titan bulge had not stayed as earth's dawn had shaped it, but gleamed red and stupendous in the sunset with the carved and polished features of a god. Stern and terrible shone that face that sunset lit with fire. How vast it was no mind can ever measure, but Carter knew at once that man could never have fashioned it. It was a god chiseled by the hands of the gods, and it looked down haughty and majestic upon the seeker. Rumor had said it was strange and not to be mistaken, and Carter saw that it was indeed so. For those long, narrow eyes and long-lobed ears, and that thin nose and pointed chin, all spoke of a race that is not of men but of gods. He clung overawed in that lofty and perilous eyrie, even though it was this which he had expected and come to find. For there is in a god's face more of marvel than prediction can tell, and when that face is vaster than a great temple, and seen looking downward at sunset in the skeptic silences of that upper world from whose dark lava it was divinely hewn of old, the marvel is so strong that none may escape it. Here, too, was the added marvel of recognition, for although he had planned to search all dreamland over for those whose likeness to this face might mark them as the god's children, he now knew that he need not do so. Certainly the great face carven on that mountain was of no strange sort, but the kin of such as he had seen often in the taverns of the seaport Selephice, which lies in Uthnargai beyond the Tenarian hills, and is ruled over by that King Coranus whom Carter once knew in waking life. Every year sailors with such a face came in dark ships from the north to trade their onyx for the carved jade and spun gold and little red singing birds of Selephice, and it was clear that these could be no others than the half-gods he sought. Where they dwelt, there must the cold waste lie close, and within it unknown Kadath and its onyx castle for the great ones. So to Selephice he must go, far distant from the isle of Oriab, and in such parts as would take him back to Dilithlin, and up the sky to the bridge by near, and again into the enchanted wood of the Zugs, whence the way would bend northward through the garden lands by Ukranos to the gilded spires of Thran, where he might find a galleon bound over the Serenarian Sea. But dusk was now thick, and the great carbon face looked down even sterner in shadow. Perched on that ledge, night found the seeker, and in the blackness he might neither go down nor go up, but only stand and cling and shiver in that narrow place till the day came, praying to keep awake lest sleep lose his hold and send him down the dizzy miles of air to the crags and sharp rocks of the accursed valley. The stars came out, but save for them there was only black nothingness in his eyes, nothingness leagued with death, against whose beckoning he might do no more than cling to the rocks and lean back away from an unseen brink. The last thing of earth that he saw in the gloaming was a condor soaring close to the westward precipice beside him, and darting, screaming away when it came near the cave whose mouth yawned just out of reach. Suddenly, without a warning sound in the dark, Carter felt his curved scimitar drawn stealthily out of his belt by some unseen hand. Then he heard it clatter down over the rocks below, and between him and the Milky Way he thought he saw a very terrible outline of something noxiously thin and horned and tailed and bat-winged. Other things, too, had begun to blot out patches of stars west of him, as if a flock of vague entities were flapping thickly and silently out of that inaccessible cave in the face of the precipice. 
Then a sort of cold, rubbery arm seized his neck, and something else seized his feet, and he was lifted inconsiderately up and swung about in space. Another minute and the stars were gone, and Carter knew that the night gaunts had got him. They bore him breathless into that cliffside cavern and through monstrous labyrinths beyond. When he struggled, as at first he did by instinct, they tickled him with deliberation. They made no sound at all themselves, and even their membranous wings were silent. They were frightfully cold and damp and slippery, and their paws needed one detestably. Soon they were plunging hideously downward through inconceivable abysses in a whirling, giddying, sickening rush of dank, tomb-like air, and Carter felt they were shooting into the ultimate vortex of shrieking and demonic madness. He screamed again and again, but whenever he did so the black paws tickled him with greater subtlety. Then he saw a sort of gray phosphorescence about, and guessed they were coming even to that inner world of subterranean horror of which dim legends tell, and which is lit only by the pale death-fire wherewith rests the ghoulish air and the primal mists of the pits at earth's core. At last, far below him, he saw faint lines of gray and ominous pinnacles, which he knew must be the fabled peaks of Throck. Awful and sinister, they stand in the haunted disk of sunless and eternal depths, higher than man may reckon, and guarding terrible valleys where the tolls crawl and burrow nastily. But Carter preferred to look at them than at his captors, which were indeed shocking and uncouth black things, with smooth, oily, whale-like surfaces, unpleasant horns that curved inward toward each other, bat wings whose beating made no sound, ugly prehensile paws, and barbed tails that lashed needlessly and disquietingly. And worst of all, they never spoke or laughed, and never smiled, because they had no faces at all to smile with, but only a suggestive blankness where a face ought to be. All they ever did was clutch and fly and tickle. That was the way of night gaunts. As the band flew lower, the peaks of Throck rose gray and towering on all sides, and one saw clearly that nothing lived on that austere and impressive granite of the endless twilight. At still lower levels, the death fires in the air gave out, and one met only the primal blackness of the void save aloft, where the thin peaks stood out goblin-like. Soon the peaks were very far away, and nothing about but great rushing winds with the dankness of nethermost grottoes in them. Then in the end, the night gods landed on a floor of unseen things which felt like layers of bones and left Carter all alone in that black valley. To bring him thither was the duty of the night gaunts that garden Granick, and this done they flapped away silently. When Carter tried to trace their flight he found he could not, since even the peaks of Throck had faded out of sight. There was nothing anywhere but blackness and horror and silence and bones. Now Carter knew from a certain source that he was in the Vale of Pnoth, where crawl and burrow the enormous holes. But he did not know what to expect, because no one has ever seen a dole, or even guessed what such a thing may be like. The holes are known only by dim rumor, from the rustling they make amongst mountains of bones and the slimy touch they have when they wriggle past one, they cannot be seen, because they creep only in the dark. Carter did not wish to meet at all, so listened intently for any sound in the unknown depths of bones about him. Even in this fearsome place he had a plan, and an objective, for whispers of Pnoth were not unknown to one with whom he had talked much in the old days. 
In brief, it seemed fairly likely that this was the spot into which all the ghouls of the waking world cast their refuse of their feastings, and that if he but had good luck, he might stumble upon that mighty crag taller even than Throx Peaks, which marks the edge of their domain. Showers of bones would tell him where to look, and once found, he could call to a ghoul to let down the ladder. For strange to say, he had a very singular link with these terrible creatures. A man he'd known in Boston, a painter of strange pictures with a secret studio in an ancient and unhallowed alley near a graveyard, had actually made friends with the ghouls and had taught him to understand the simpler part of their disgusting meeping and gibbering. This man had vanished at last, and Carter was not sure, but that he might find him now, and use for the first time in dreamland that faraway English of his dim waking life. In any case, he felt he could persuade a ghoul to guide him out of Pnoth, and it would be better to meet a ghoul, which one can see, than a doll, which one cannot see. End of part three. Section four of The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath by Howard Phillips Lovecraft. This the Gamist recording may be distributed and adapted freely for any purpose. Read by Martin Rato. Part four. So Carter walked in the dark and ran when he thought he heard something among the bones underfoot. Once he bumped into a stony slope and knew it must be the base of one of Throck's peaks. Then at last he heard a monstrous rattling and clatter which reached far up in the air and became sure he'd come nigh the crag of the ghouls. He was not sure he could be heard from this valley miles below, but realized that the inner world has strange laws. As he pondered, he was struck by a flying bone so heavy that it must have been a skull, and therefore realizing his nearness to the fateful crag, he sent up as best he might that meeping cry which is the call of the ghoul. Sound travels slowly, so it was some time before he heard an answering glimmer. But it came at last, and before long he was told that a rope ladder would be lowered. The wait for this was very tense, since there was no telling what might not have been stirred up among those bones by his shouting. Indeed, it was not long before he actually did hear a vague rustling afar off. As this thoughtfully approached, he became more and more uncomfortable, for he did not wish to move away from the spot where the ladder would come. Finally, the tension grew almost unbearable, and he was about to flee in panic when the thud of something on the newly heaped bones nearby drew his notice from the other sound. It was the ladder, and after a minute of groping, he'd had it taut in his hands. But the other sound did not cease, and followed him even as he climbed. He'd gone fully five feet from the ground when the rattling beneath waxed emphatic, and was a good ten feet up when something swayed the ladder from below. At a height which must have been fifteen or twenty feet, he felt his whole side brushed by a great slippery length which grew alternately convex and concave with wriggling and hereafter he climbed desperately to escape the unendurable nuzzling of that loathsome and overfed dole, whose form no man might see. For hours he climbed with aching and blistered hands, seeing again the grey death-fire and Throck's uncomfortable pinnacles. At last he discerned above him the projecting edge of the great crag of the ghouls, whose vertical side he could not glimpse, 
and hours later he saw a curious face peering over it as a gargoyle peers over a parapet of Notre Dame. This almost made him lose his hold through faintness, but a moment later he was himself again, for his vanished friend Richard Pickman had once introduced him to a ghoul, and he knew well their canine faces and slumping forms and unmentionable idiosyncrasies. So he had himself well under control when that hideous thing pulled him out of the dizzy emptiness over the edge of the crag and did not scream at the partly consumed refuse heaped at one side or at the squatting circles of ghouls who gnawed and watched curiously. He was now on a dim, litten plain whose sole topographical features were great boulders and the entrances of burrows. The ghouls were in general respectful, even if one did attempt to pinch him while several others eyed his leanness speculatively. Through patient glibbering he made inquiries regarding his vanished friend and found he'd become a ghoul of some prominence in abysses nearer to the waking world. A greenish elderly ghoul offered to conduct him to Pickman's present habitation, so despite a natural loathing he followed the creature into a capacious burrow and crawled after him for hours in the blackness of rank mold. They emerged on a dim plain strewn with singular relics of earth, old gravestones, broken urns, and grotesque fragments of monuments, and Carter realized with some emotion that he was probably nearer the waking world than at any other time since he'd gone down the seven hundred steps, from the cavern of flame to the gate of deeper slumber. There, on a tombstone of 1768, stolen from the granary burying ground in Boston, sat a ghoul which was once the artist Richard Upton Pickman. It was naked and rubbery, and had acquired so much of the ghoulish physiognomy that its human origin was already obscure. But it still remembered a little English, and was able to converse with Carter in grunts and monosyllables, helped out now and then by the glibbering of ghouls. When it learned that Carter wished to get to the Enchanted Wood, and from there to the city Selephice and Uthnargai beyond the Tenarian hills, it seemed rather doubtful, for these ghouls of the waking world do no business in the graveyards of Upper Dreamland, leaving that to the red-footed whomps that are spawned in dead cities, and many things intervened betwixt their gulf and the Enchanted Wood, including the terrible kingdom of the Gugs. The Gugs hairy and gigantic, once reared stone circles in that wood and made strange sacrifices to the other gods and the crawling chaos near Lothotep, until one night an abomination of theirs reached the ears of earth's gods and they were banished to caverns below. Only a great trap-door of stone with an iron ring connects the abyss of the earth ghouls with the enchanted wood, and this the Gugs are afraid to open because of a curse. That a mortal dreamer could traverse their cavern realm and leave by that door is inconceivable, for mortal dreamers were their former food, and they have legends of the toothsomeness of such dreamers, even though banishment has restricted their diet to the ghasts. Those repulsive beings which die in the light and which live in the vaults of Zin and leap on long hind legs like kangaroos. So the ghoul that was Pickman advised Carter either to leave the abyss at Sarkomand, that deserted city in the valley below Leng, where black nitrous stairways guarded by winged diorote lions lead down from dreamland to the lower gulfs, or to return through a churchyard to the waking world and begin the quest anew down the seventy steps of light slumber to the cavern of flame and the seven hundred steps to the gate of deeper slumber and the enchanted wood. This, however, did not suit the seeker, for he knew nothing of the way from Leng to Utnargai, 
and was likewise reluctant to awake lest he forget all he had so far gained in this dream. It was disastrous to his quest to forget the august and celestial faces of those seamen from the north who traded onyx and celephice, and who, being the sons of gods, must point the way to the cold waste and Kadath where the great ones dwell. After much persuasion, the ghoul consented to guide his guest inside the great wall of the Gug's kingdom. There was one chance that Carter might be able to steal through that twilight realm of circular stone towers at an hour when the giants would be all gorged and snoring indoors, and reach the central tower with the sign of Koth upon it, which has the stairs leading up to that stone trap door in the enchanted wood. Hickman even consented to lend three ghouls to help with the tombstone lever in raising the stone door, for of ghouls the gugs are somewhat afraid, and they often flee from their own colossal graveyards when they see them feasting there. He also advised Carter to disguise as a ghoul himself, shaving the beard he'd allowed to grow, for ghouls have none, wallowing naked in the mold to get the correct surface, and loping in the usual slumping way with his clothing carried in a bundle as if it were a choice morsel from a tomb. They would reach the city of Gugs, which is coterminous with the whole kingdom, through the proper burrows, emerging in a cemetery not far from the stair-containing Tower of Koth. They must beware, however, of a large cave near the cemetery, for this is the mouth of the vaults of Zin, and the vindictive ghasts are always on watch there murderously for those denizens of the upper abyss who hunt and prey on them. The ghasts try to come out when the gugs sleep, and they attack ghouls as readily as gugs, for they cannot discriminate. They are very primitive and eat one another. The Gugs have a sentry at a narrow in the vaults of Zin, but he's often drowsy and is sometimes surprised by a party of ghasts. Though ghasts cannot live in real light, they can endure the gray twilight of the abyss for hours. So at length Carter crawled through endless burrows with three helpful ghouls bearing the slate gravestone of Colonel Nepemiah Derby, Obit 1719, from the Chartered Street burying ground in Salem. When they came again into open twilight, they were in a forest of vast lichened monoliths reaching nearly as high as the eye could see and forming the modest gravestones of the Gugs. On the right of the hole out of which they wriggled and seen through aisles of monoliths was a stupendous vista of cyclopean round towers mounting up illimitable into the gray air of inner earth. This was the great city of the Gugs, whose doorways are thirty feet high. Ghouls come here often, for a buried Gug will feed a community for almost a year, and even with the added peril it is better to burrow for Gugs than to bother with the graves of men. Carter now understood the occasional tightened bones he'd felt beneath him in the Vale of Penoth. Straight ahead, and just outside the cemetery, rose a sheer perpendicular cliff at whose base an immense and forbidding cavern yawned. This the ghouls told Carter to avoid as much as possible, since it was the entrance to the unhallowed vaults of Zin, where Gugs hunt ghasts in the darkness, and truly that warning was soon well justified, for the moment a ghoul began to creep toward the towers to see if the hour of the Gugs resting had been rightly timed, there glowed in the gloom of that great cavern's mouth first one pair of yellowish-red eyes and then another, implying that the Gugs were one century less and that ghasts have indeed an excellent sharpness of smell. So the ghoul returned to the burrow and motioned his companions to be silent. It was best to leave the ghasts to their own devices, 
and there was a possibility that they might soon withdraw, since they must naturally be rather tired after coping with the gug sentry and the black vaults. After a moment something about the size of a small horse hopped out into the grey twilight, and Carter turned sick at the aspect of that scabrous and unwholesome beast, whose face is so curiously human despite the absence of a nose, a forehead, and other important particulars. Presently three other ghasts hopped out to join their fellow, and a ghoul glibbered softly at Carter that their absence of battle scars was a bad sign. It proved that they had not fought the Gug sentry at all, but had merely slipped past him as he slept, so that their strength and savagery were still unimpaired, and would remain so till they'd found and disposed of a victim. It was very unpleasant to see those filthy and disproportioned animals, which soon numbered about fifteen, grubbing about and making their kangaroo leaps in the grey twilight, where titan towers and monoliths arose, but it was still more unpleasant when they spoke among themselves in the coughing gutturals of ghasts. And yet horrible as they were, they were not so horrible as what presently came out of the cave after them, with disconcerting suddenness. It was a paw, fully two feet and a half across, and equipped with formidable talons. After it came another paw, and after that a great black-furred arm to which both of the paws were attached by short forearms. Then two pink eyes shone, and the head of the awakened gug sentry, large as a barrel, wobbled into view. The eyes jutted two inches from each side, shaded by bony protuberances overgrown with coarse hairs. But the head was chiefly terrible because of the mouth. That mouth had great yellow fangs and ran from the top to the bottom of the head, opening vertically instead of horizontally. But before that unfortunate gug could emerge from the cave and rise to his full twenty feet, the vindictive ghasts were upon him. Carter feared for a moment that he would give an alarm and arouse all his kin, till a ghoul softly glibbered that Gugs have no voice, but talk by means of facial expression. The battle which then ensued was truly a frightful one. From all sides the venomous ghasts rushed feverishly at the creeping Gug, nipping and tearing with their muzzles, and mauling murderously with their hard-pointed hooves. All the time they coughed excitedly, screaming when the great vertical mouth of the gug would occasionally bite into one of their number, so that the noise of the combat would surely have aroused the sleeping city had not the weakening of the sentry begun to transfer the action farther and farther within the cavern. As it was, the tumult soon receded altogether from sight and the blackness, with only occasional evil echoes to mark its continuance. Then the most alert of the ghouls gave the signal for all to advance, and Carter followed the loping three out of the forest of monoliths and into the dark, noisome streets of that awful city whose rounded towers of cyclopean stone soared up beyond the site. Silently they shambled over that rough rock pavement, hearing with disgust the abominable muffled snortings from great black doorways which marked the slumber of the gugs. Apprehensive of the ending of the rest hour, the ghouls set a somewhat rapid pace, but even so the journey was no brief one, for distances in that town of giants are on a great scale. At last, however, they came to a somewhat open space before a tower even vaster than the rest, above whose colossal doorway was fixed a monstrous symbol and bas-relief, which made one shudder without knowing its meaning. This was the central tower with the sign of Koth, and those huge stone steps just visible through the dusk within were the beginning of the great flight leading to Upper Dreamland and the Enchanted Wood. 
There now began a climb of interminable length in utter blackness, made almost impossible by the monstrous size of the steps, which were fashioned for gugs and were therefore nearly a yard high. Of their number, Carter could form no just estimate, for he soon became so worn out that the tireless and elastic ghouls were forced to aid him. All through the endless climb there lurked the peril of detection and pursuit, for though no gug dares lift the stone door to the forest because of the Great One's curse, there are no such restraints concerning the tower and the steps and escape ghasts are often chased even to the very top. So sharp are the ears of Gugs that the bare feet and hands of the climbers might readily be heard when the city awoke, and it would of course take but little time for the striding giants, accustomed from their ghast haunts in the vaults of Zin to seeing without light, to overtake their smaller and slower quarry on those cyclopean steps. It was very depressing to reflect that the silent pursuing Gugs would not be heard at all, but would come very suddenly and shockingly in the dark upon the climbers. Nor could the traditional fear of Gugs for ghouls be depended upon in that peculiar place where the advantages lay so heavily with the Gugs. There was also some peril from the furtive and venomous ghasts, which frequently hopped up onto the tower during the sleep hour of the Gugs. If the Gugs slept long, and the ghasts returned soon from their deed in the cavern, the scent of the climbers might easily be picked up by those loathsome and ill-disposed things, in which case it would almost be better to be eaten by a Gug. Then, after aeons of climbing, there came a cough from the darkness above, and matters assumed a very grave and unexpected turn. It was clear that a ghast, or perhaps even more, had strayed into that tower before the coming of Carter and his guides, and it was equally clear that this peril was very close. After a breathless second, the leading ghoul pushed Carter to the wall and arranged his kinfolk in the best possible way with the old slate tombstone raised for a crushing blow whenever the enemy might come in sight. Ghouls can see in the dark, so the party was not as badly off as Carter would have been alone. In another moment, the clatter of hooves revealed the downward hopping of at least one beast, and the slab-bearing ghouls poised their weapon for a desperate blow. Presently two yellowish-red eyes flashed into view, and the panting of the ghast became audible above its clattering. As it hopped down to the step above the ghouls, they wielded the ancient gravestone with prodigious force, so that there was only a wheeze and a choking before the victim collapsed in a noxious heap. There seemed to be only this one animal, and after a moment of listening, the ghouls tapped Carter as a signal to proceed again. As before, they were obliged to aid him, and he was glad to leave that place of carnage where the ghast's uncouth remains sprawled invisible in the blackness. At last, the ghouls brought their companion to a halt, and feeling above him, Carter realized that the great stone trap door was reached at last. To open so vast a thing completely was not to be thought of, but the ghouls hoped to get it up just enough to slip the gravestone under as a prop and permit Carter to escape through the crack. They themselves planned to descend again and return through the city of the Gugs, since their elusiveness was great, and they did not know the way overland to spectral sarcomand with its lion-guarded gate to the abyss. Mighty was the straining of those three ghouls at the stone of the door above them, and Carter helped push with as much strength as he had. They judged the edge next to the top of the staircase to be the right one, and to this they bent all the force of their disreputably nourished muscles. After a few moments a crack of light appeared, and Carter, to whom that task had been entrusted, 
slipped the end of the old gravestone in the aperture. There now ensued a mighty heaving, but progress was very slow, and they had, of course, to return to their first position every time they failed to turn the slab and prop the portal open. Suddenly their desperation was magnified a thousandfold by a sound on the steps below them. It was only the thumping and rattling of the slain gas hoofed body as it rolled down to lower levels. But of all the possible causes of that body's dislodgment and rolling, none was in the least reassuring. Therefore, knowing the ways of Guggs, the ghoul set to with something of a frenzy, and in a surprisingly short time had the door so high that they were able to hold it still while Carter turned the slab and left the generous opening. They now helped Carter through, letting him climb up to their rubbery shoulders and later guiding his feet as he clutched at the blessed soil of the upper dreamland outside. Another second and they were through themselves, knocking away the gravestone and closing the great trap door while a panting became audible beneath. Because of the Great One's curse, no Gug might ever emerge from that portal, so with a deep relief and sense of repose, Carter lay quietly on the thick, grotesque fungi of the enchanted wood, while his guide squatted near in the manner that ghouls rest. Weird as was that enchanted wood through which he had fared so long ago, it was verily a haven and a delight after those gulfs he had now left behind. There was no living denizen about, for Zooks shunned the mysterious door in fear, and Carter at once consulted with his ghouls about their future course. To return through the tower they no longer dared, and the waking world did not appeal to them when they learned that they must pass the priests, Nashed and Kamantha in the cavern of flame. So at length they decided to return through Sarcomand and its gate of the abyss, though of how to get there they knew nothing. Carter recalled that it lies in the valley below Leng, and recalled likewise that he'd seen in Dilathleen a sinister, slant-eyed old merchant reputed to trade on Leng, Therefore he advised the ghouls to seek out Dilathleen, crossing the fields to Nir and the sky, and following the river to its mouth. This they at once resolved to do, and lost no time in loping off, since the thickening of the dusk promised a full night ahead for travel. And Carter shook the paws of those repulsive beasts, thanking them for their help and sending his gratitude to the beast which once was Pikmin, but could not help sighing with pleasure when they left. For a ghoul is a ghoul, and at best an unpleasant companion for man. After that Carter sought a forest pool and cleansed himself of the mud of nether earth, thereupon reassuming the clothes he had so carefully carried. It was now night in that redoubtable wood of monstrous trees, but because of the phosphorescence one might travel as well as by day, wherefore Carter set out upon the well-known route toward Selephice, in Uthnargai beyond the Tenarian hills. And as he went he thought of the zebra he had left tethered to an ash tree on a granic in faraway Oriab so many aeons ago and wondered if any lava gatherers had fed and released it. And he wondered, too, if he would ever return to Baharna and pay for the zebra that was slain by night in those ancient ruins by Yath's shore, and if the old tavern keeper would remember him. Such were the thoughts that came to him in the air of the regained upper dreamland. But presently his progress was halted by a sound from a very large hollow tree. He had avoided the great circle of stones, since he did not care to speak with Zoogs just now, but it appeared from the singular fluttering in that huge tree that important councils were in session elsewhere. 
Upon drawing nearer, he made out the accents of a tense and heated discussion, and before long became conscious of matters which he viewed with the greatest concern, for a war on the cats was under debate in that sovereign assembly of Zugs. It all came from the loss of the party which had sneaked after Carter to Ulthar, and which the cats had justly punished for unsuitable intentions. The matter had long rankled, and now, or at least within a month, the marshaled Zugs were about to strike the whole feline tribe in a series of surprise attacks, taking individual cats or groups of cats unawares, and giving not even the myriad cats of Ulthar a proper chance to drill and mobilize. This was the plan of the Zugs, and Carter saw that he must foil it before leaving upon his mighty quest. Very quietly, therefore, did Randolph Carter steal to the edge of the wood and send the cry of the cat over the starlit fields, and a great grimalkin in a nearby cottage took up the burden and relayed it across leagues of rolling meadow to warriors large and small, black, gray, tiger, white, yellow, and mixed, and it echoed through near and beyond the sky, even into Ulthar, and Ulthar's numerous cats called in chorus and fell into a line of march. It was fortunate that the moon was not up so that all the cats were on earth. Swiftly and silently leaping, they sprang from every hearth and housetop and poured in a great furry sea across the plains to the edge of the wood, Carter was there to greet them, and the sight of shapely, wholesome cats was indeed good for his eyes after the things he'd seen and walked with in the abyss. He was glad to see his venerable friend and one-time rescuer at the head of Ulthar's detachment, a collar of rank around his sleek neck and whiskers bristling at a martial angle. Better still, as a sub-lieutenant in that army was a brisk young fellow who proved to be none other than the very little kitten at the inn to whom Carter had given a saucer of rich cream on that long vanished morning in Ulthar. He was a strapping and promising cat now, and purred as he shook hands with his friend. His grandfather said he was doing very well in the army, and that he might well expect a captaincy after one more campaign. End of part four. Section five of The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath by Howard Phillips Lovecraft. This Legamus recording may be distributed and adapted freely for any purpose. Read by Martin Rato. Part 5 Carter now outlined the peril of the cat tribe, and was rewarded by deep-throated purrs of gratitude from all sides. Consulting with the generals, he prepared a plan of instant action which involved marching at once upon the Zug Council and other known strongholds of Zugs, forestalling their surprise attacks and forcing them to terms before the mobilization of their army of invasion. Thereupon, without a moment's loss, that great ocean of cats flooded the enchanted wood and surged around the council tree and the great stone circle. Flutterings rose to panic pitch as the enemy saw the newcomers, and there was very little resistance among the furtive and curious brown zoogs. They saw that they were beaten in advance and turned from thoughts of vengeance to thoughts of present self-preservation. Half the cats now seated themselves in a circular formation with the captured zoogs in the center, leaving open a lane down which were marched the additional captives rounded up by the other cats in other parts of the wood. Terms were discussed at length, 
Carter acting as interpreter, and it was decided that the Zugs might remain a free tribe on condition of rendering to the cats a large tribute of grouse, quail, and pheasants from the less fabulous parts of the forest. Twelve young Zugs of noble families were taken as hostages to be kept in the Temple of Cats at Ulthar, and the victors made it plain that any disappearances of cats on the borders of the Zug domain would be followed by consequences highly disastrous to Zugs. These matters disposed of, the assembled cats broke ranks and permitted the Zugs to slink off one by one to their respective homes, which they hastened to do with many a sullen backward glance. The old cat general now offered Carter an escort through the forest to whatever border he wished to reach, deeming it likely that the Zugs would harbor dire resentment against him for the frustration of their warlike enterprise. This offer he welcomed with gratitude, not only for the safety it afforded, but because he liked the graceful companionship of cats. So in the midst of a pleasant and playful regiment, Relaxed after the successful performance of its duty, Randolph Carter walked with dignity through that enchanted and phosphorescent wood of titan trees, talking of his quest with the old general and his grandson, whilst others of the band indulged in fantastic gambles or chased fallen leaves that the wind drove among the fungi of that primeval floor. And the old cat said that he had heard much of unknown Kadath in the cold waste, but did not know where it was. As for the marvelous Sunset City, he had not even heard of that, but would gladly relay to Carter anything he might later learn. He gave the seeker some passwords of great value among the cats of Dreamland, and commended him especially to the old chief of the cats in Selephites, whither he was bound. That old cat, already slightly known to Carter, was a dignified Maltese, and would prove highly influential in any transaction. It was dawn when they came to the proper edge of the wood, and Carter bade his friends a reluctant farewell. The young sub-lieutenant he had met as a small kitten would have followed him had not the old general forbidden it, but that austere patriarch insisted that the path of duty lay with the tribe and the army. So Carter set out alone over the golden fields that stretched mysterious beside a willow-fringed river, and the cats went back into the wood. Well did the traveler know those garden lands that lie betwixt the wood of the Serenarian Sea, and blithely did he follow the singing river Ukianos that marked his course. The sun rose higher over gentle slopes of grove and lawn, and heightened the colors of the thousand flowers that starved each knoll and dangle. A blessed haze lies upon all this region, wherein is held a little more of the sunlight than other places hold, and a little more of the summer's humming music of birds and bees so that men walk through it as through a fairy place, and feel greater joy and wonder than they ever afterward remember. By noon Carter reached the jasper terraces of Curan, which slope down to the river's edge, and bear that temple of loveliness wherein the king of Elakvad comes from his far realm on the twilight sea once a year, in a golden palanquin, to pray to the god of Ukianos, who sang to him in youth when he dwelt in a cottage by its banks. All of Jasper is that temple, and covering an acre of ground with its walls and courts, its seven pinnacled towers, and its inner shrine where the river enters through hidden channels and the god sings softly in the night. Many times the moon hears strange music as it shines on those courts and terraces and pinnacles, but whether that music be the song of the god or the chant of the cryptical priests, none but the king of Elakvad may say, for only he had entered the temple or seen the priests. 
Now, in the drowsiness of day, that carbon and delicate fain was silent, and Carter heard only the murmur of the great stream and the hum of the birds and bees as he walked onward under the enchanted sun. All that afternoon the pilgrim wandered on through perfumed meadows, and in the lee of gentle riverward hills bearing peaceful thatched cottages, and the shrines of amiable gods carven from jasper or chrysoberyl. Sometimes he walked close to the bank of Ukianos and whistled to the sprightly and iridescent fish of that crystal stream, and at other times he paused amidst the whispering rushes and gazed at the dark wood on the farther side, whose trees came down clear to the water's edge. In former dreams he had seen quaint lumbering bupoths come shyly out of that wood to drink, but now he could not glimpse any. Once in a while he paused to watch a carnivorous fish catch a fishing bird, which it lured to the water by showing its tempting scales in the sun, and grasped by the beak with its enormous mouth as the winged hunter sought to dart down upon it. Toward evening he mounted a low grassy rise and saw before him flaming in the sunset the thousand gilded spires of Thran. Lofty beyond belief are the alabaster walls of that incredible city, sloping inward toward the top and wrought in one solid piece by what means no man knows, for they are more ancient than memory. Yet lofty as they are, with their hundred gates and two hundred turrets, the clustered towers within, all white beneath their golden spires, are loftier still so that men on the plain around see them soaring into the sky, sometimes shining clear, sometimes caught at the top in tangles of cloud and mist, and sometimes clouded lower down with their utmost pinnacles blazing free above the vapors. And where Thron's gates open on the river are great wharves of marble, with ornate galleons of fragrant cedar and calamander riding gently at anchor, and strange bearded sailors sitting on casks and bales with the hieroglyphs of far places. Landward beyond the walls lies the farm country, where small white cottages dream between little hills, and narrow roads with many stone bridges wind gracefully among the streams and gardens. Down through this verdant land Carter walked at evening, and saw twilight float up from the river to the marvelous golden spires of Thron. And just at the hour of dusk he came to the southern gate, and was stopped by a red-robed sentry till he had told three dreams beyond belief and proved himself a dreamer worthy to walk up Thron's steep, mysterious streets and linger in the bazaars where the wares of the ornate galleons were sold. Then into that incredible city he walked, through a wall so thick that the gate was a tunnel, and thereafter amidst curved and undulant ways winding deep and narrow between the heavenward towers. Lights shone through grated and balconied windows, and the sound of lutes and pipes stole timid from inner courts where marble fountains bubbled. Carter knew his way and edged down through darker streets to the river, where at an old sea tavern he found the captains and seamen he had known in myriad other dreams. There he bought his passage to Selephice on a great green galleon, and there he stopped for the night after speaking gravely to the venerable cat of that inn, who blinked dozing before an enormous hearth and dreamed of old wars and forgotten gods. In the morning Carter boarded the galleon bound for Selephice, and sat in the prow as the ropes were cast off and the long sail down to the Serenarian Sea began. For many leagues the banks were much as they were above Thron, with now and then a curious temple rising on the farther hills toward the right, and a drowsy village on the shore, 
with steep red roofs and nets spread in the sun. Mindful of his search, Carter questioned all the mariners closely about those whom they'd met at the taverns of Selephis, asking the names and ways of the strange men with long, narrow eyes, long-lobed ears, thin noses, and pointed chins, who came in dark ships from the north and traded onyx for the carved jade and spun gold, and little red singing birds of Selephis. Of these men the sailors knew not much, save that they talked but seldom, and spread a kind of awe about them. Their land, very far away, was called Inquinoch, and not many people cared to go thither because it was a cold twilight land, and set to be close to unpleasant Lang. Although high, impassable mountains towered on the side where Lang was thought to lie, so that none might say whether this evil plateau with its horrible stone villages and unmentionable monastery were really there, or whether the rumor were only a fear that timid people felt in the night when those formidable barrier peaks loomed black against a rising moon. Certainly men reached Lang from very different oceans, of other boundaries of Inquinoch, those sailors had no notion, nor had they heard of the cold waste and unknown Kadath, save from vague, unplaced report. And of the marvelous sunset city which Carter sought, they knew nothing at all. So the traveler asked no more of far things, but bided his time till he might talk with those strange men from cold and twilight Inquinoch, who were the seed of such gods as carved their features on Engranic. Late in the day the galleon reached those bends of the river which traversed the perfumed jungles of Kied. Here Carter wished he might disembark, for in those tropic tangles sleep wondrous palaces of ivory, lone and unbroken where once dwelt fabulous monarchs of a land whose name is forgotten. Spells of the elder ones keep those places unharmed and undecayed, for it is written that they may one day be need of them again, and elephant caravans have glimpsed them from afar by moonlight, though none dares approach them closely because of the guardians to which their wholeness is due. But the ship swept on, and dusk hushed the hum of the day, and the first stars above blinked answers to the early fireflies on the banks as that jungle fell far behind, leaving only its fragrance as a memory that it had been. And all through the night that galleon floated on past mysteries unseen and unsuspected. Once a lookout reported fires on the hills to the east, but the sleepy captain said they'd better not be looked at too much, since it was highly uncertain just who or what had lit them. In the morning the river had broadened out greatly, and Carter saw by the houses along the banks that they were close to the vast trading city of Lanith on the Serenarian Sea. Here the walls are of rugged granite, and the houses peakedly fantastic with beamed and plastered gables. The men of Hlanith are more like those of the waking world than any others in dreamland, so that the city is not sought except for barter, but is prized for the solid work of its artisans. The wharves of Hlanith are of oak, and there the galleon made fast while the captain traded in the taverns. Carter also went ashore and looked curiously upon the rutted streets where wooden ox-carts lumbered and feverish merchants cried their wares vacuously in the bazaars. The sea taverns were all close to the wharves on cobbled lanes salted with the spray of high tides and seemed exceedingly ancient with their low black-beamed ceilings and casements of greenish bullseye panes. Ancient sailors in those taverns talked much of distant ports, and told many stories of the curious men from twilight Inquinoch, but had little to add to what the seamen of the galleon had told. 
Then at last, after much unloading and loading, the ship set sail once more over the sunset sea, and the high walls and gables of Hlaneth grew less, as the last golden light of day lent them a wonder and beauty beyond any that men had given them. Two nights and two days the galleon sailed over the Serenarian Sea, sighting no land and speaking but one other vessel. Then, near sunset of the second day, there loomed up ahead the snowy peak of Iran, with its ginkgo trees swaying on the lower slope, and Carter knew that they were come to the land of Uthnargai and the marvelous city of Selephis. Swiftly there came into sight the glittering minarets of that fabulous town, and the untarnished marble walls with their bronze statues, and the great stone bridge where Naraxa joins the sea. Then rose the gentle hills behind the town, with their groves and gardens of asphodels and small shrines and cottages upon them, and far in the background the purple ridge of the Tenarians, potent and mystical, behind which lay forbidden ways into the waking world and toward other regions of dream. The harbor was full of painted galleys, some of which were from the marble cloud city of Seranian that lies in ethereal space beyond where the sea meets the sky, and some of which were from more substantial parts of dreamland. Among these the steersman threaded his way up to the spice-fragrant wharves, where the galleon made fast in the dusk as the city's million lights began to twinkle out over the water. Ever new seemed this deathless city of vision, for here time has no power to tarnish or destroy. As it has always been, is still the turquoise of Nath Horthath, and the eighty orchid weathered priests are the same who builded it ten thousand years ago. Shining still is the bronze of the great gates, nor are the onyx pavements ever worn or broken, and the great bronze statues on the walls look down on merchants and camel drivers older than fable, yet without one gray hair in their forked beards. Carter did not once seek out the temple, or the palace, or the citadel, but stayed by the seaward wall among traders and sailors, and when it was too late for rumors and legends, he sought out an ancient tavern he knew well, and rested with dreams of the gods on unknown Kadath whom he sought. The next day he searched all along the quays for some of the strange mariners of Inquinoch, but was told that none were now in port, their galley not being due from the north for full two weeks. He found, however, one Thorabonian sailor who'd been to Inquinoch and had worked in the onyx quarries of that twilight place, and this sailor said there was certainly a descent to the north of the peopled region, which everybody seemed to fear and shun. The Thorabonian opined that this desert led around the utmost rim of impassable peaks into Lang's horrible plateau, and that this was why men feared it, though he admitted there were other vague tales of evil presences and nameless sentinels. Whether or not this could be the fabled waste wherein unknown Kadath stands, he did not know, but it seemed unlikely that those presences and sentinels if indeed they existed, were stationed for naught. On the following day, Carter walked up the street of the pillars to the turquoise temple and talked with the high priest. Though Nath Horthath is chiefly worshipped in Selephis, all the great ones are mentioned in diurnal prayers, and the priest was reasonably versed in their moods. Like Atal in distant Ulthar, he strongly advised against any attempts to see them, declaring that they are testy and capricious, and subject to strange protection from the mindless other gods from outside, whose soul and messenger is the crawling chaos Nearlathotep.
Their jealous hiding of the marvelous sunset city showed clearly that they did not wish Carter to reach it, and it was doubtful how they would regard a guest whose object was to see them and plead before them. No man had ever found Kadath in the past, and it might be just as well if none ever found it in the future. Such rumors as were told about that onyx castle of the Great Ones were not by any means reassuring. Having thanked the orchid crowned high priest, Carter left the temple and sought out the bazaar of the sheep butchers, where the old chief of Selephi's cats dwelt sleek and contented. That gray and dignified being was sunning himself on the onyx pavement and extended a languid paw as his caller approached. But when Carter repeated the passwords and introductions furnished him by the old cat general of Ulthar, the furry patriarch became very cordial and communicative and told much of the secret lore known to cats on the seaward slopes of Uthnargai. Best of all, he repeated several things told him furtively by the timid waterfront cats of Selephis about the men of Inquinoc, on whose dark ships no cat will go. It seems that these men have an aura not of earth about them, though that is not the reason why no cat will sail on their ships. The reason for this is that Inquinoc holds shadows which no cat can endure, so that in all that cold twilight realm there is never a cheering purr or a homely mew. Whether it be because of things wafted over the impassable peaks from hypothetical Leng, or because of things filtering down from the chilly desert to the north, none may say. But it remains a fact that in that far land there broods a hint of outer space which cats do not like, and to which they are more sensitive than men. Therefore they will not go on the dark ships that seek the basalt keys of Inquinoc. The old chief of the cats also told him where to find his friend King Kuranis, who in Carter's latter dreams had reigned alternately in the rose-crystal palace of the seventy delights at Selephis and in the turreted cloud castle of sky-floating Seranian. It seemed that he could no more find content in those places, but had formed a mighty longing for the English cliffs and downlands of his boyhood, where in little dreaming villages England's old songs hover at evening behind lattice windows, and where grey church towers peep lovely through the verdure of distant valleys. He could not go back to these things in the waking world because his body was dead. But he'd done the next best thing, and dreamed a small tract of such countryside in the region east of the city where meadows roll gracefully up from the sea cliffs to the foot of the Tenarian hills. There he dwelt, in a grey Gothic manor house of stone looking on the sea, and tried to think it was ancient Trevor Towers, where he was born, and where thirteen generations of his forefathers had first seen the light and on the coast nearby he'd built a little Cornish fishing village with steep cobbled ways, settling therein such people as had the most English faces, and seeking ever to teach them the dear remembered accents of old Cornwall fishers. And in a valley not far off, he'd reared a great Norman abbey whose tower he could see from his window, placing around it in the churchyard grey stones with the names of his ancestors carved thereon, and with a moss somewhat like old England's moss. For though Coranus was a monarch in the land of dream, with all imagined pomps and marvels, splendors and beauties, ecstasies and delights, novelties and excitements at his command, he would gladly have resigned forever the whole of his power and luxury and freedom for one blessed day as a simple boy in that pure and quiet England, that ancient beloved England which had molded his being and of which he must always be immutably a part. So when Carter bade that old great chief of the cats adieu, he did not seek the terraced palace of rose crystal, 
but walked out the eastern gate and across the daisied fields toward a peaked gable which he glimpsed through the oaks of a park, sloping up to the sea cliffs. And in time he came to a great hedge and a gate with a little brick lodge, and when he rang the bell there hobbled to admit him no robed and anointed lackey of the palace, but a small stubby old man in a smock, who spoke as best he could in the quaint tones of far Cornwall. And Carter walked up the shady path between trees as near as possible to England's trees, and climbed the terraces among gardens, set out as in Queen Anne's time. At the door, flanked by stone cats in the old way, he was met by a whiskered butler in suitable livery, and was presently taken to the library where Coranus, Lord of Uthnargai and the sky around Seranian, sat pensive in a chair by the window, looking on his little sea-coast village, and wishing that his old nurse would come in and scold him because he was not ready for that hateful lawn party at the vicar's, with the carriage waiting and his mother nearly out of patience. Coranus, clad in a dressing-gown of the sort favoured by London tailors in his youth, rose eagerly to meet his guest, for the sight of an Anglo-Saxon from the waking world was very dear to him, even if it was a Saxon from Boston, Massachusetts, instead of from Cornwall, and for long they talked of old times, having much to say, because both were old dreamers and well versed in the wonders of incredible places. Coranus, indeed, had been out beyond the stars in the ultimate void, and was said to be the only one who'd ever returned sane from such a voyage. At length Carter brought up the subject of his guest, and asked of his host those questions he had asked of so many others. Coranus did not know where Kadath was, or the marvelous Sunset City, but he did know that the Great Ones were very dangerous creatures to seek out, and that the other gods had strange ways of protecting them from impertinent curiosity. He had learned much of the other gods in distant parts of space, especially in that region where form does not exist and colored gases study the innermost secrets. The violet gas, Sinkak, had told him terrible things of the crawling chaos Nyarlathotep, and had warned him never to approach the central void where the demon Sultan Azathoth gnaws hungrily in the dark. Altogether it was not well to meddle with the Elder Ones, and if they persistently denied all access to the marvelous Sunset City, it were better not to seek that city. Coranus furthermore doubted whether his guest would profit aught by coming to the city, even were he to gain it. He himself had dreamed and yearned long years for lovely Selephis and the land of Uthnargai, and for the freedom and color and high experience of life devoid of its chains and conventions and stupidities. But now that he was coming to that city and that land, and was the king thereof, he found the freedom and the vividness all too soon worn out and monotonous for want of linkage with anything firm in his feelings and memories. He was a king in Uthnargai, but found no meaning therein, and drooped always for the old familiar things of England that had shaped his youth. All his kingdom would he give for the sound of Cornish church bells over the downs, and all the thousand minarets of Selephites for the steep, homely roofs of the village near his home. So he told his guests that the unknown Sunset City might not hold quite that content, he sought, and that perhaps it had better remain a glorious and half-remembered dream. For he had visited Carter often in the old waking days, and knew well the lovely New England slopes that had given him birth. At the last he was very certain the seeker would long only for the early remembered scenes. The glow of Beacon Hill at evening, the tall steeples and winding hill streets of quaint Kingsport, the hoary gambrel roofs of ancient and witch-haunted Arkham, 
and the blessed meads and valleys where stone walls rambled and white farmhouse gables peeped out from bowers of verdure. These things he told Randolph Carter, but still the seeker held to his purpose, and in the end they parted each with his own conviction, and Carter went back through the bronze gate into Selefice and down the street of pillars to the old sea wall, where he talked more with the mariners of far ports and waited for the dark ship from cold and twilight in Quinnock, whose strange-faced sailors and onyx traders had in them the blood of the great ones. End of part five. Section 6 of The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath by Howard Phillips Lovecraft. This Legomus recording may be distributed and adapted freely for any purpose. Read by Martin Rato. Part 6 One starlit evening when the pharaohs shone splendid over the harbor, the longed-for ship put in, and strange-faced sailors and traders appeared one by one and group by group in the ancient taverns along the sea wall. It was very exciting to see again those living faces so like the godlike features of Engranic, but Carter did not hasten to speak with the silent seamen. He did not know how much of pride and secrecy and dim supernal memory might fill those children of the Great Ones, and was sure it would not be wise to tell them of his quest or ask too closely of that cold desert stretching north of their twilight land. They talked little with the other folk in those ancient sea taverns, but would gather in groups in remote corners and sing among themselves the haunting airs of unknown places, or chant long tales to one another in accents alien to the rest of dreamland. And so rare and moving were those airs and tales that one might guess their wonders from the faces of those who listened, even though the words came to common ears only a strange cadence and obscure melody. For a week the strange seamen lingered in the taverns and traded in the bazaars of Selefice, and before they sailed Carter had taken passage on their dark ship, telling them that he was an old onyx miner and wishful to work in their quarries. That ship was very lovely and cunningly wrought, being of teakwood with ebony fittings and traceries of gold, and the cabin in which the traveler lodged had hangings of silk and velvet. One morning at the turn of the tide the sails were raised and the anchor lifted, and as Carter stood on the high stern, he saw the sunrise blazing walls and bronze statues and golden minarets of ageless cellophys sink into the distance, and the snowy peak of Mount Man grow smaller and smaller. By noon there was nothing in sight save the gentle blue of the Serenarian Sea, with one painted galley afar off, bound for that realm of Seranian where the sea meets the sky. And the night came with gorgeous stars, and the dark ship steered for Charles's wain and the little bear as they swung slowly around the pole. And the sailors sang strange songs of unknown places, and they stole off one by one to the forecastle where the wistful watchers murmured old chants and leaned over the rail to glimpse the luminous fish playing in bowers beneath the sea. Carter went to sleep at midnight and rose in the glow of a young morning, marking that the sun seemed farther south than was its wont and all through that second day he made progress in knowing the men of the ship getting them little by little to talk of their cold twilight land, 
of their exquisite onyx city and of their fear of the high and impassable peaks beyond which Lang was set to be. They told him how sorry they were that no cats would stay in the land of Inquinoch, and how they thought the hidden nearness of Lang was to blame for it. Only of the stony desert to the north they would not talk. There was something disquieting about that desert, and it was thought expedient not to admit its existence. On later days they talked of the quarries in which Carter said he was going to work. There were many of them, for all the city of Inquinoch was builded of onyx, while straight polished blocks of it were traded in Renar, Agrothan, and Celephice, and at home with the merchants of Thra, Flarnek, and Kadatharon, for the beautiful wares of those fabulous ports. And far to the north, almost in the cold desert whose existence the men of Inquinoc did not care to admit, there was an unused quarry greater than all the rest, from which had been hewn in forgotten time such prodigious lumps and blocks that the sight of their chiseled vacancy struck terror to all who beheld. Who had mined those incredible blocks, and whither had they been transported, no man might say, but it was thought best not to trouble that quarry around which such inhuman memories might conceivably cling. So it was left all alone in the twilight, with only the raven and the rumored shantak bird to brood on its immensities. When Carter heard of this quarry, he was moved to deep thought, for he knew from old tales that the Great One's castle atop unknown Kadath is of onyx. Each day the sun wheeled lower and lower in the sky, and the mists overhead grew thicker and thicker, and in two weeks there was not any sunlight at all, but only a weird gray twilight shining through a dome of eternal cloud by day, and a cold starless phosphorescence from the underside of that cloud by night. On the twentieth day a great jagged rock in the sea was sighted from afar, the first land glimpsed since man's snowy peak had dwindled behind the ship. Carter asked the captain the name of that rock, but was told that it had no name and had never been sought by any vessel because of the sounds that came from it at night. And when, after dark, a dull and ceaseless howling arose from that jagged granite place, the traveler was glad that no stop had been made and that the rock had no name. The seamen prayed and chanted till the noise was out of earshot, and Carter dreamed terrible dreams within dreams in the small hours. Two mornings after that there loomed far ahead and to the east, a line of great gray peaks whose tops were lost in the changeless clouds of that twilight world. And at the sight of them the sailors sang glad songs, and some knelt down on the deck to pray, so that Carter knew they were come to the land of Inquinoc and would soon be moored to the basalt keys of the great town bearing that land's name. Toward noon at dark coastline appeared, and before three o'clock there stood out against the north the bulbous domes and fantastic spires of the onyx city. Rare and curious did that archaic city rise above its walls and keys, all of delicate black with scrolls, flutings, and arabesques of inlaid gold. Tall and many-windowed were the houses, and carved on every side with flowers and patterns whose dark symmetries dazzled the eye with a beauty more poignant than light. Some ended in swelling domes that tapered to a point, others in terraced pyramids whereon rose clustered minarets displaying every phase of strangeness and imagination. The walls were low and pierced by frequent gates, each under a great arch rising high above the general level and capped by the head of a god chiseled with that same skill displayed in the monstrous face on distant Negronic. 
On a hill in the center rose a sixteen-angled tower greater than all the rest, and bearing a high pinnacle belfry resting on a flattened dome. This, the seamen said, was the temple of the elder ones, and was ruled by an old high priest sad with inner secrets. At intervals the clang of a strange bell shivered over the onyx city, answered each time by a peal of mystic music made up of horns, viols, and chanting voices. And from a row of tripods on a galley round the high dome of the temple there burst flares of flame at certain moments, for the priests and people of that city were wise in the primal mysteries and faithful in keeping the rhythms of the great ones as set forth in scrolls older than the Pnecotic manuscripts. As the ship rode past the great basalt breakwater into the harbor, the lesser noises of the city grew manifest, and Carter saw the slaves, sailors, and merchants on the docks. The sailors and merchants were of the strange-faced race of the gods, but the slaves were squat, slant-eyed folks, set by rumor to have drifted somehow across or around the impassable peaks from the valleys beyond Lang. The wharves reached wide outside the city wall and bore upon them all manner of merchandise from the galleys anchored there, while at one end were great piles of onyx, both carved and uncarved, awaiting shipment to the far markets of Renar, Orgathan, and Selephis. It was not yet evening when the dark ship anchored beside a jutting quay of stone, and all the sailors and traders filed ashore and through the arched gate into the city. The streets of that city were paved with onyx, and some of them were wide and straight, whilst others were crooked and narrow. The houses near the water were lower than the rest, and bore above their curiously arched doorways certain signs of gold, set to be in honor of the respective small gods that favored each. The captain of the ship took Carter to an old sea tavern, where flocked the mariners of quaint countries, and promised that he would next day show him the wonders of the twilight city and lead him to the taverns of the onyx miners by the northern wall. And evening fell, and little bronze lamps were lighted, and the sailors in that tavern sang songs of remote places. But when from its high tower the great bell shivered over the city, and the peal of the horns and viols and voices rose cryptical and answered thereto. All ceased their songs or tales and bowed silent till the last echo died away. For there is a wonder and a strangeness on the twilight city of Inquinoc, and men fear to be lax in its rites, lest a doom and a vengeance lurk unsuspectedly close. Far in the shadows of that tavern, Carter saw a squat form he did not like, for it was unmistakably that of the old slant-eyed merchant he had seen so long before in the taverns of Dilathleen, who was reputed to trade with the horrible stone villages of Lang which no healthy folk visit, and whose evil fires are seen at night from afar and even to have dealt with that high priest not to be described, which wears a yellow silken mask over its face and dwells all alone in a prehistoric stone monastery. This man had seemed to show a queer gleam of knowing when Carter asked the traders of Dilathleen about the cold waste and Kadath, and somehow his presence in dark and haunted Inquinoc so close to the wonders of the north was not a reassuring thing. He slipped wholly out of sight before Carter could speak to him, and sailors later said that he'd come with a yak caravan from some point not well determined, bearing the colossal and rich-flavored eggs of the rumored Shantak bird to trade for the dexterous jade goblets that merchants brought from Ilarnek. On the following morning, the ship captain led Carter through the onyx streets of Inquinoc, 
dark under their twilight sky. The inlaid doors and figured house fronts, carven balconies and crystal paned oriels all gleamed with a somber and polished loveliness. And now and then a plaza would open out with black pillars, colonnades, and the statues of curious beings, both human and fabulous. Some of the vistas down long and unbending streets or through side alleys and over bulbous domes, spires, and arabesque roofs were weird and beautiful beyond words. And nothing was more splendid than the massive heights of the great central temple of the Elder Ones with its sixteen carven sides, its flattened dome, and its lofty pinnacled belfry overtopping all else and majestic whatever its foreground. And always to the east, far beyond the city walls and the leagues of pasture land, rose the gaunt gray sides of those topless and impassable peaks across which hideous Lang was set to lie. The captain took Carter to the mighty temple, which is set with its walled garden in a great round plaza whence the streets go as spokes from a wheel's hub. The seven arched gates of that garden, each having over it a carven face like those on the city's gates, are always open, and the people roam reverently at will down the tiled paths and through the little lanes lined with grotesque termini and the shrines of modest gods. And there are fountains, pools, and basins there to reflect the frequent blaze of the tripods on the high balcony, all onyx and having in them small luminous fish taken by divers from the lower bowers of ocean. When the deep clang from the temple belfry shivers over the gardens and the city, and the answer of the horns and viols and voices peals out from the seven lodges by the garden gates, there issue from the seven doors of the temple long columns of masked and hooded priests in black, bearing at arm's length before them great golden bowls from which a curious steam rises. And all the seven columns struck peculiarly in single file, legs thrown far forward without bending the knees, down the walks that lead to the seven lodges, wherein they disappear and do not appear again. It is said that subterrane paths connect the lodges with the temple, and that the long files of priests return through them, nor is it unwhispered that deep flights of onyx steps go down to mysteries that are never told. But only a few are those who hint that the priests in the mast and hooded columns are not human beings. Carter did not enter the temple, because none but the veiled king is permitted to do that. But before he left the garden, the hour of the bell came, and he heard the shivering clang deafening above him, and the wailing of the horns and viols and voices loud from the lodges by the gates. And down the seven great walks stalked the long files of bowl-bearing priests in their singular way, giving to the traveler a fear which human priests do not often give. When the last of them had vanished, he left that garden, noting as he did so a spot on the pavement over which the bowls had passed. Even the ship captain did not like that spot and hurried him on toward the hill whereon the Vale King's palace rises many-domed and marvelous. The ways to the Onyx Palace are steep and narrow, all but the broad curving one where the king and his companions ride on yaks or in yak-drawn chariots. Carter and his guide climbed up an alley that was all steps between inlaid walls bearing strange signs in gold and under balconies and oriels where sometimes floated soft strains of music or breaths of exotic fragrance. Always ahead loomed those titan walls, mighty buttresses, and clustered and bulbous domes for which the veiled king's palace is famous. And at length they passed under a great black arch and emerged in the gardens of the monarch's pleasure. There Carter paused in faintness at so much beauty, 
for the onyx terraces and colonnaded walks, the gay portieres and delicate flowering trees espalier to golden lattices, the brazen urns and tripods with cunning bas-reliefs, the pedestaled and almost breathing statues of veined black marble, the basalt-bottomed lagoons, tiled fountains with luminous fish, the tiny temples of iridescent singing birds atop carven columns, the marvelous scrollwork of the great bronze gates and the blossoming vines trained along every inch of the polished walls, all joined to form a sight whose loveliness was beyond reality and half fabulous even in the land of dreams. There it shimmered like a vision under that gray twilight sky with the domed and fretted magnificence of the palace ahead and the fantastic silhouette of the distant impassable peaks on the right. And ever the small birds and the fountains sang while the perfume of rare blossoms spread like a veil over that incredible garden. No other human presence was there, and Carter was glad it was so. Then they turned and descended again the onyx alley of steps, for the palace itself no visitor may enter, and it is not well to look too long and steadily at the great central dome, since it is set to house the archaic father of all the rumored Shantak birds, and to send out queer dreams to the curious. After that, the captain took Carter to the north quarter of the town, near the gate of the caravans, where are the taverns of the yak merchants and the onyx miners. And there, in a low-ceilinged inn of quarrymen, they set farewell, for business called the captain whilst Carter was eager to talk with miners about the north. There were many men in that inn, and the traveler was not long in speaking to some of them, saying that he was an old miner of onyx and anxious to know somewhat of Inquinox quarries. But all that he learned was not much more than he knew before, for the miners were timid and evasive about the cold desert to the north and the quarry that no man visits. They had fears of fabled emissaries from around the mountains where Lenga set to lie, and of evil presences and nameless sentinels far north among the scattered rocks. And they whispered also that the rumored Shantak birds are no wholesome things, it being indeed for the best that no man has ever truly seen one, for that fabled father of Shantaks in the king's dome is fed in the dark. The next day, saying that he wished to look over all the various mines for himself and to visit the scattered farms and quaint onyx villages of Inquinoch, Carter hired a yak and stuffed great leathern saddlebags for a journey. Beyond the gate of the caravans, the road lay straight betwixt tilled fields, with many odd farmhouses crowned by low domes. At some of these houses the seekers stopped to ask questions, once finding a host so austere and reticent and so full of an unplaced majesty like to that in the huge features on Granik, that he felt certain he had come at last upon one of the great ones themselves, or upon one with full nine-tenths of their blood dwelling amongst men and to that austere and reticent cotter he was careful to speak very well of the gods, and to praise all the blessings they had ever accorded him. That night Carter camped in a roadside meadow beneath a great legath tree to which he tied his yak, and in the morning resumed his northward pilgrimage. At about ten o'clock he reached the small domed village of Urg, where traders rest and miners tell their tales, and paused in its taverns until noon. It is here that the great caravan road turns west towards Salarn, but Carter kept on north by the quarry road. 
All the afternoon he followed that rising road, which was somewhat narrower than the great highway, and which now led through a region with more rocks than tilled fields. And by evening the low hills on his left had risen into sizable black cliffs, so that he knew he was close to the mining country. All the while the great gaunt sides of the impassable mountains towered afar off at his right, and the farther he went, the worse tales he heard of them from the scattered farmers and traders and drivers of lumbering onyx carts along the way. On the second night he camped in the shadow of a large black crag, tethering his yak to a stake driven in the ground. He observed the greater phosphorescence of the clouds at his northerly point, and more than once thought he saw dark shapes outlined against them. And on the third morning he came in sight of the first onyx quarry, and greeted the men who there labored with picks and chisels. Before evening he had passed eleven quarries, the land being here given over altogether to onyx cliffs and boulders, with no vegetation at all, but only great rocky fragments scattered about a floor of black earth, with the gray, impassable peaks always rising gaunt and sinister on his right. The third night he spent in a camp of quarry men whose flickering fires cast weird reflections on the polished cliffs to the west, and they sang many songs and told many tales, showing such strange knowledge of the olden days and the habits of gods that Carter could see that they held many latent memories of their sires, the great ones. They asked him whither he went and cautioned him not to go too far to the north, but he replied that he was seeking new cliffs of onyx and would take no more risks than were common among prospectors. In the morning he bade them adieu and rode on into the darkening north, where they had warned him he would find the feared and unvisited quarry whence hands older than men's hands had wrenched prodigious blocks. But he did not like it when, turning back to wave a last farewell, he thought he saw approaching the camp that squat and evasive old merchant with slanting eyes, whose conjectured traffic with Lang was the gossip of distant Dilathleen. After two more quarries, the inhabited part of Inquinox seemed to end, and the road narrowed to a steeply rising yak path among forbidding black cliffs. Always on the right towered the gaunt and distant peaks, and as Carter climbed farther and farther into this untraversed realm, he found it grew darker and colder. Soon he perceived that there were no prints of feet or hooves on the black path beneath, and realized that he was indeed come into strange and deserted ways of elder time. Once in a while a raven would croak far overhead, and now and then a flapping behind some vast rock would make him think uncomfortably of the rumored Shantak bird. But in the main he was alone with his shaggy steed, and it troubled him to observe that this excellent yak became more and more reluctant to advance, and more and more disposed to snort affrightedly at any small noise along the route. The path now contracted between sable and glistening walls and began to display an even greater steepness than before. It was a bad footing, and the yak often slipped on the stony fragments strewn thickly about. In two hours Carter saw ahead a definite crest beyond which was nothing but dull gray sky and blessed the prospect of a level or downward course. To reach this crest, however, was no easy task, for the way had grown nearly perpendicular and was perilous with loose black gravel and small stones. Eventually Carter dismounted and let his dubious yak, pulling very hard when the animal balked or stumbled, and keeping his own footing as best he might. Then suddenly he came to the top and saw beyond, and gasped at what he saw. 
The path, indeed, led straight ahead and slightly down, with the same lines of high natural walls as before, but on the left hand there opened out a monstrous space, vast acres in extent, where some archaic power had riven and rent the native cliffs of onyx in the form of a giant's quarry. Far back into the solid precipice ran that cyclopean gouge, and deep down within earth's bowels its lower delvings yawned. It was no quarry of man, and the concave sides were scarred with great squares, yards wide, which told of the size of the blocks once hewn by nameless hands and chisels. High over its jagged rim huge ravens flapped and croaked, and vague whirrings in the unseen depths told of bats or urhags, or less mentionable presences haunting the endless blackness. There Carter stood in the narrow way amidst the twilight with the rocky path sloping down before him, Tall onyx cliffs on his right that led on as far as he could see, and tall cliffs on the left chopped off just ahead to make that terrible and unearthly quarry. All at once the yak uttered a cry and burst from his control, leaping past him and darting on in a panic till it vanished down the narrow slope toward the north. Stones kicked by its flying hoofs fell over the brink of the quarry and lost themselves in the dark without any sound of striking bottom. But Carter ignored the perils of that scanty path as he raced breathlessly after the flying steed. Soon the left-behind cliffs resumed their course, making the way once more a narrow lane and still the traveller leaped on after the yak whose great wide prints told of its desperate flight. Once he thought he heard the hoofbeats of the frightened beast and doubled his speed from this encouragement. He was covering miles, and little by little the way was broadening in front till he knew he must soon emerge on the cold and dreaded desert to the north. The gaunt gray flanks of the distant impassable peaks were again visible above the right-hand crags, and ahead were the rocks and boulders of an open space which was clearly a foretaste of the dark, arid, limitless plain. And once more those hoofbeats sounded in his ears, plainer than before but this time giving terror instead of encouragement, because he realized that they were not the frightened hoofbeats of his fleeing yak. The beats were ruthless and purposeful, and they were behind him. End of Part 6 Section 7 of The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath by Howard Phillips Lovecraft. This Legamus recording may be distributed and adapted freely for any purpose. Read by Martin Rato. Part 7 Carter's pursuit of the yak became now a flight from an unseen thing. For though he dared not glance over his shoulder, he felt that the presence behind him could be nothing wholesome or mentionable. His yak must have heard or felt it first, and he did not like to ask himself whether it had followed him from the haunts of men or had floundered up out of that black quarry pit. Meanwhile, the cliffs had been left behind, so that the oncoming night fell over a great waste of sand and spectral rocks wherein all paths were lost. He could not see the hoofprints of his yak, but always from behind him there came that detestable clopping, mingled now and then with what he fancied were titanic flappings and whirrings. That he was losing ground seemed unhappily clear to him, and he knew he was hopelessly lost in this broken and blasted desert of meaningless rocks and untraveled sands. 
Only those remote and impassable peaks on the right gave him any sense of direction, and even they were less clear as the gray twilight waned and the sickly phosphorescence of the clouds took its place. Then, dim and misty in the darkling north before him, he glimpsed a terrible thing. He had thought it for some moments a range of black mountains, but now he saw it was something more. The phosphorescence of the brooding clouds showed it plainly, and even silhouetted parts of it as vapors glowed behind. How distant it was he could not tell, but it must have been very far. It was thousands of feet high, stretching in a great concave arc from the gray impassable peaks to the unimagined westward spaces, and had once indeed been a ridge of mighty onyx hills. But now these hills were hills no more, for some hand greater than man's had touched them. Silent they squatted there atop the world like wolves or ghouls, crowned with clouds and mists and guarding the secrets of the north forever. All in a great half-circle they squatted, those dog-like mountains carven into monstrous watching statues, and their right hands were raised in menace against mankind. It was only the flickering light of the clouds that made their mitered double heads seem to move, but as Carter stumbled on he saw arise from their shadowy caps great forms whose motions were no delusion. Winged and whirring, those forms grew larger each moment, and the traveler knew his stumbling was at an end. They were not any birds or bats known elsewhere on earth or in dreamland, for they were larger than elephants and had heads like horses. Carter knew that they must be the Shantag birds of ill rumor, and wondered no more what evil guardians and nameless sentinels made men avoid the boreal rock desert. And as he stopped in final resignation, he dared at last to look behind him, where indeed was trotting the squat, slant-eyed trader of evil legend, grinning astride a lean yak, and leading on a noxious horde of leering shantaks to whose wings still clung the rhyme and nitre of the nether pits. Trapped though he was by fabulous and hypocephalic winged nightmares that pressed around in great unholy circles, Randolph Carter did not lose consciousness. Lofty and horrible, those titan gargoyles towered above him, while the slant-eyed merchant leaped down from his yak and stood grinning before the captive. Then the man motioned Carter to mount one of the repugnant shantaks, helping him up as his judgment struggled with his loathing. It was hard work ascending, for the shantak bird had scales instead of feathers, and those scales are very slippery. Once he was seated, the slant-eyed man hopped up behind him, leaving the lean yak to be led away northward toward the ring of carbon mountains by one of the incredible bird colossi. There now followed a hideous whirl through frigid space, endlessly up and eastward toward the gaunt gray flanks of those impassable mountains beyond which Lang was set to be. Far above the clouds they flew, till at last there lay beneath them those fabled summits which the folk of Inquinoc have never seen, and which lie always in high vortices of gleaming mist. Carter beheld them very plainly as they passed below, and saw upon their topmost peaks strange caves, which made him think of those on Inkranic. But he did not question his captor about these things when he noticed that both the man and the horse-headed Shantak appeared oddly fearful of them. Hurrying past nervously and showing great tension until they were left far in the rear, the Shantak now flew lower, revealing beneath the canopy of cloud a gray, barren plain, whereon at great distance shone little feeble fires. 
As they descended, there appeared at intervals lone huts of granite and bleak stone villages whose tiny windows glowed with pallid light. And there came from those huts and villages a shrill droning of pipes and a nauseous rattle of crotella, which proved at once that Inquinox people are right in their geographic rumors. For travelers have heard such sounds before, and know that they float only from the cold desert plateau which healthy folk never visit. That haunted place of evil and mystery, which is Lang. Around the feeble fire's dark forms were dancing, and Carter was curious as to what manner of beings they might be, for no healthy folk have ever been to Lang, and the place is known only by its fires and stone huts as seen from afar. Very slowly and awkwardly did those forms leap, and with an insane twisting and bending not good to behold, so that Carter did not wonder at the monstrous evil imputed to them by vague legend, or the fear in which all dreamland holds their abhorrent frozen plateau. As the Shantak flew lower, the repulsiveness of the dancers became tinged with a certain hellish familiarity, and the prisoner kept straining his eyes and racking his memory for clues to where he'd seen such creatures before. They leaped as though they had hooves instead of feet, and seemed to wear a sort of wig or headpiece with small horns. Of other clothing they had none but most of them were quite furry. Behind they had dwarfish tails, and when they glanced upward he saw the excessive width of their mouths. Then he knew what they were, and that they did not wear any wigs or headpieces after all, for the cryptic folk of Leng were of one race with the uncomfortable merchants of the black galleys that traded rubies at Dilathleen those not-quite-human merchants who are the slaves of the monstrous moon-things. They were indeed the same dark folk who had shank Hyde Carter on their noisome galley so long ago, and whose kith he had seen driven in herds about the unclean wharves of that accursed lunar city, with the leaner ones toiling and the fatter ones taken away in crates for other needs, of their polypus and amorphous masters. Now he saw where such ambiguous creatures came from, and shuddered at the thought that Lang must be known to these formless abominations from the moon. But the Shantak flew on past the fires and the stone huts and the less-than-human dancers, and soared over sterile hills of grey granite and dim wastes of rock and ice and snow. Day came, and the phosphorescence of low clouds gave place to the misty twilight of that northern world, and still the vile bird winged meaningly through the cold and silence. At times the slant-eyed man talked with his steed in a hateful and guttural language, and the Shantak would answer with tittering tones that rasped like the scratching of ground glass. All this while the land was getting higher, and finally they came to a windswept tableland which seemed the very roof of a blasted and tenantless world. There, all alone in the hush and the dusk and the cold, rose the uncouth stones of a squat, windowless building, around which a circle of crude monoliths stood. In all this arrangement there was nothing human, and Carter surmised from old tales that he was indeed come to that most dreadful and legendary of all places— the remote and prehistoric monastery wherein dwells uncompanioned the high priest not to be described, which wears a yellow silken mask over its face and prays to the other gods and their crawling chaos near Lothotep. The loathsome bird now settled to the ground, and the slant-eyed man hopped down and helped his captive alight. 
Of the purpose of his seizure, Carter now felt very sure, for clearly the slant-eyed merchant was an agent of the darker powers, eager to drag before his masters a mortal whose presumption had aimed at the finding of unknown Kadath and the saying of a prayer before the faces of the great ones in their onyx castle. It seemed likely that this merchant had caused his former capture by the slaves of the moon things in Dilathleen, and that he now meant to do what the rescuing cats had baffled, taking the victim to some dread rendezvous with monstrous Nyarlathotep, and telling with what boldness the seeking of unknown Kadath had been tried. Lang and the cold waste north of Enquinoch must be close to the other gods, and there the passes to Kadath are well guarded. The slant-eyed man was small, but the great hippocephalic bird was there to see he was obeyed. So Carter followed where he led and passed within the circle of standing rocks and into the low arched doorway of that windowless stone monastery. There were no lights inside, but the evil merchant lit a small clay lamp bearing morbid bas-reliefs and prodded his prisoner on through mazes of narrow winding corridors. On the walls of the corridors were printed frightful scenes older than history, and in a style unknown to the archaeologists of earth. After countless aeons their pigments were brilliant still, for the cold and dryness of hideous lank keep alive many primal things. Carter saw them fleetingly in the rays of that dim and moving lamp, and shuddered at the tale they told. Through those archaic frescoes Lang's annals stalked, and the horned, hoofed, and wide-mouthed almost humans danced evilly amidst forgotten cities. There were scenes of old wars wherein Lang's almost humans fought with the bloated purple spiders of the neighboring vales. And there were scenes also of the coming of the black galleys from the moon, and the submission of Lang's people to the polypus and amorphous blasphemies that hopped and floundered and wriggled out of them. Those slippery, grayish-white blasphemies they worshipped as gods, nor ever complained when scores of their best and fatted males were taken away in the black galleys. The monstrous moon beasts made their camp on a jagged isle in the sea, and Carter could tell from the frescoes that this was none other than the lone, nameless rock he'd seen when sailing to Inquinoch, that gray, accursed rock which Inquinoch seamen shun, and from which vile howlings reverberate all through the night. And in those frescoes were shown the great seaport and capital of the almost humans, proud and pillared betwixt the cliffs and the basalt wharves, and wondrous with high fanes and carven places. Great gardens and columned streets let from the cliffs, and from each of the six sphinx-crowned gates to a vast central plaza, and in that plaza was a pair of winged colossal lions guarding the top of a subterranean staircase. Again and again were those huge winged lions shown, their mighty flanks of diorite glistening in the gray twilight of the day and the cloudy phosphorescence of the night. And as Carter stumbled past their frequent and repeated pictures, it came to him at last what indeed they were, and what city it was that the almost humans had ruled so anciently before the coming of the black galleys. There could be no mistake, for the legends of dreamland are generous and profuse. Indubitably that primal city was no less a place than storied Sarcomand whose ruins had bleached for a million years before the first true human saw the light, and whose twin titan lions guard eternally the steps that lead down from dreamland to the great abyss.
Other views showed the gaunt gray peaks dividing Lang from Inquinoc, and the monstrous shantag birds that build nests on the ledges halfway up, and they showed likewise the curious caves near the very topmost pinnacles, and how even the boldest of shantags fly screaming away from them. Carter had seen those caves when he passed over them and had noticed their likeness to the caves on Ingranic. Now he knew that the likeness was more than a chance one, for in these pictures were shown their fearsome denizens, and those bat wings, curving horns, barbed tails, prehensile paws and rubbery bodies were not strange to him. He had met those silent, flitting, and clutching creatures before, those mindless guardians of the great abyss whom even the great ones fear, and who own not Nyarlathotep but hoary Nodans as their lord. For they were the dreaded night gaunts, who never laugh or smile because they have no faces, and who flop unendingly in the dark between the veil of Pnath and the passes to the outer world. The slant-eyed merchant had now prodded Carter into a great domed space, whose walls were carved in shocking bas-reliefs, and whose center held a gaping circular pit surrounded by six malignly stained stone altars in a ring. There was no light in this vast, evil-smelling crypt, and the small lamp of the sinister merchant shone so feebly that one could grasp details only little by little. At the farther end was a high stone dais reached by five steps, and there on a golden throne sat a lumpish figure robed in yellow silk figured with red and having a yellow silken mask over its face. To this being the slant-eyed man made certain signs with his hands, and the lurker in the dark replied by raising a disgustingly carven flute of ivory and silk-covered paws and blowing certain loathsome sounds from beneath its flowing yellow mask. This colloquy went on for some time, and to Carter there was something sickeningly familiar in the sound of that flute and the stench of the malodorous place. It made him think of a frightful red litten city and of the revolting procession that once filed through it, of that and of an awful climb through lunar countryside beyond, before the rescuing rush of Earth's friendly cats. He knew that the creature on the dais was without doubt the high priest not to be described, of which legend whispered such fiendish and abnormal possibilities, but he feared to think just what that abhorred high priest might be. Then the figured silk slipped the trifle from one of the grayish-white paws, and Carter knew what the noisome high priest was. And in that hideous second, stark fear drove him to something his reason would never have dared to attempt, for in all his shaken consciousness there was room only for one frantic will to escape from what squatted on that golden throne. He knew that hopeless labyrinths of stone lay betwixt him and the cold table land outside, and that even on that tableland the noxious Shantak still waited. Yet in spite of all this, there was in his mind only the instant need to get away from that wriggling, silk-robed monstrosity. The slant-eyed man had set the curious lamp upon one of the high and wickedly stained altar stones by the pit, and had moved forward somewhat to talk to the high priest with his hands. Carter, hitherto wholly passive, now gave that man a terrific push with all the wild strength of fear, so that the victim toppled at once into that gaping well which rumor holds to reach down to the hellish vaults of Zin, 
where gooks haunt ghasts in the dark. In almost the same second he seized the lamp from the altar and darted out into the frescoed labyrinths, racing this way and that as chance determined, and trying not to think of the stealthy padding of shapeless paws on the stones behind him, or of the silent wrigglings and crawlings which must be going on back there in lightless corridors. After a few minutes he regretted his thoughtless haste, and wished he had tried to follow backwards the frescoes he had passed on the way in. True, they were so confused and duplicated that they could not have done him much good, but he wished nonetheless he had made the attempt. Those he now saw were even more horrible than those he'd seen then, and he knew he was not in the corridors leading outside. In time he became quite sure he was not followed and slackened his pace somewhat, but scarce had he breathed in half-relief when a new peril beset him. His lamp was waning, and he would soon be in pitch blackness with no means of sight or guidance. When the light was all gone, he groped slowly in the dark and prayed to the great ones for such help as they might afford. At times he felt the stone floor sloping up or down, and once he stumbled over a step for which no reason seemed to exist. The farther he went, the damper it seemed to be, and when he was able to feel the junction or the mouth of a side passage, he always chose the way which sloped downward the least. He believed, though, that his general course was down, and the vault-like smell and incrustations on the greasy walls and floor alike warned him he was burrowing deep in Lang's unwholesome tableland. But there was not any warning of the thing which came at last. Only the thing itself, with its terror and shock and breathtaking chaos. One moment he was groping slowly over the slippery floor of an almost level place, and the next he was shooting dizzily downward in the dark through a burrow which must have been well-nigh vertical. Of the length of that hideous sliding he could never be sure, but it seemed to take hours of delirious nausea and ecstatic frenzy. Then he realized he was still, with the phosphorescent clouds of a northern night shining sickly above him. All around were crumbling walls and broken columns, and the pavement on which he lay was pierced by straggling grass and wrenched asunder by frequent shrubs and roots. Behind him a basalt cliff rose topless and perpendicular, its dark side sculptured into repellent scenes and pierced by an arched and carven entrance to the inner blackness out of which he'd come. Ahead stretched double rows of pillars and the fragments and pedestals of pillars that spoke of a broad and bygone street, and from the urns and basins along the way he knew it had been a great street of gardens. Far off at its end the pillars spread to mark a vast round plaza, and in that open circle there loomed gigantic under the lurid night clouds a pair of monstrous things. Huge winged lions of diorite they were, with blackness and shadow between them. Full twenty feet they reared their grotesque and unbroken heads and snarled derisive on the ruins around them. And Carter knew right well what they must be, for legend tells of only one such twain. They were the changeless guardians of the great abyss, and these dark ruins were in truth primordial sarcomand. Carter's first act was to close and barricade the archway in the cliff with fallen blocks and odd debris that lay around. He wished no follower from Leng's hateful monastery, for along the way ahead would lurk enough of other dangers. Of how to get from Sarcoman to the peopled parts of Dreamland he knew nothing at all, 
nor could he gain much by descending to the grottoes of the ghouls, since he knew they were no better informed than he. The three ghouls which had helped him through the city of Gugs to the outer world had not known how to reach Sarcomand in their journey back, but had planned to ask old traders in Dilathleen. He did not like to think of going again to the subterrane world of Gugs and risking once more that hellish tower of Koth with its cyclopean steps leading to the enchanted wood. Yet he felt he might have to try this course if all else failed. Over Lang's plateau, past the lone monastery, he dared not go unaided, for the high priest's emissaries must be many, while at the journey's end there would no doubt be the Shantax and perhaps other things to deal with. If he could get a boat, he might sail back to Inquinoc, past the jagged and hideous rock in the sea, for the primal frescoes in the monastery labyrinth had shown that this frightful place lies not far from Sarkoman's basalt keys. But to find a boat in this aeon-deserted city was no probable thing, and it did not appear likely that he could ever make one. Such were the thoughts of Randolph Carter when a new impression began beating upon his mind. All this while there had stretched before him the great corpse-like width of fabled Sarcomand with his black broken pillars and crumbling sphinx-crowned gates and titaned stones and monstrous winged lions against the sickly glow of those luminous night clouds. Now he saw far ahead and on the right a glow that no clouds could account for, and knew he was not alone in the silence of that dead city. The glow rose and fell fitfully, flickering with a greenish tinge which did not reassure the watcher, and when he crept closer down the littered street and through some narrow gaps between tumbled walls, he perceived that it was a campfire near the wharves, with many vague forms clustered darkly around it and a lethal odor hanging heavily over all. Beyond was the oily lapping of the harbor water with a great ship riding at anchor, and Carter paused in stark terror when he saw that the ship was indeed one of the dreaded black galleys from the moon. Then just as he was about to creep back from that detestable flame, he saw a stirring among the vague dark forms and heard a peculiar and unmistakable sound. It was the frightened meeping of a ghoul, and in a moment it had swelled to a veritable chorus of anguish. Secure as he was in the shadow of monstrous ruins, Carter allowed his curiosity to conquer his fear and crept forward again instead of retreating. Once in crossing an open street he wriggled worm-like on his stomach, and in another place he had to rise to his feet to avoid making a noise among heaps of fallen marble. But he always succeeded in avoiding discovery, so that in a short time he'd found a spot behind a tightened pillar where he could watch the whole green litten scene of action. There, around a hideous fire fed by the obnoxious stems of lunar fungi, there squatted a stinking circle of the toad-like moon beasts and their almost human slaves. Some of these slaves were heating curious iron spears in the leaping flames, and at intervals applying their white-hot points to three tightly trussed prisoners that lay writhing before the leaders of the party. From the motions of their tentacles, Carter could see that the blunt-snouted moon-beasts were enjoying the spectacle hugely, and vast was his horror when he suddenly recognized a frantic meeping and knew that the tortured ghouls were none other than the faithful trio which had guided him safely from the abyss and had thereafter set out from the enchanted wood to find Sarkomand and the gate to their native deeps. The number of malodorous moon-beasts about that greenish fire was very great, 
and Carter saw that he could do nothing now to save his former allies. Of how the ghouls had been captured he could not guess, but fancied that the great hote-like blasphemies had heard them inquire in Delathleen concerning the way to Sarcomand, and had not wished them to approach so closely the hateful plateau of Lang and the high priest not to be described. For a moment he pondered on what he ought to do, and recalled how near he was to the gate of the ghoul's black kingdom. Clearly it was wisest to creep east to the plaza of twin lions and descend at once to the gulf, where assuredly he would meet no horrors worse than those above, and where he might soon find ghouls eager to rescue their brethren and perhaps to wipe out the moonbeast from the black galley. It occurred to him that the portal, like other gates to the abyss, might be guarded by flocks of night gaunts. But he did not fear these faceless creatures now. He had learned that they are bound by solemn treaties with the ghouls, and the ghoul which was Pikmin had taught him how to glibber a password they understood. End of part seven. Section eight of the Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath by Howard Phillips Lovecraft. This legamus recording may be distributed and adapted freely for any purpose. Read by Martin Rato. Part 8. So Carter began another silent crawl through the ruins, edging slowly toward the great central plaza and the winged lions. It was ticklish work, but the moon beasts were pleasantly busy and did not hear the slight noises which he twice made by accident among the scattered stones. At last he reached the open space and picked his way among the stunned trees and vines that had grown up therein. The gigantic lions loomed terrible above him in the sickly glow of the phosphorescent night clouds, but he manfully persisted toward them and presently crept round to their faces, knowing it was on that side he would find the mighty darkness which they guard. Ten feet apart crouched the mocking-faced beasts of diorite, brooding on cyclopean pedestals whose sides were chiseled in fearsome bar-reliefs. Betwixt them was a tiled court with a central space which had once been railed with balusters of onyx. Midway in the space a black well opened, and Carter soon saw that he had indeed reached the yawning gulf whose crusted and moldy stone steps lead down to the crypts of nightmare. Terrible is the memory of that dark descent in which hours wore themselves away whilst Carter wound sightlessly round and round down a fathomless spiral of steep and slippery stairs. So worn and narrow were the steps and so greasy with the ooze of inner earth that the climber never quite knew when to expect a breathless fall and hurtling down to the ultimate pits. And he was likewise uncertain just when or how the guardian night gaunts would suddenly pounce upon him, if indeed there were any stationed in this primeval passage. All about him was a stifling odor of nether gulfs, and he felt that the air of these choking depths was not made for mankind. In time he became very numb and somnolent, moving more from automatic impulse than from reasoned will, nor did he realize any change when he stopped moving altogether as something quietly seized him from behind. He was flying very rapidly through the air before a malevolent tickling told him that the rubbery night gods had performed their duty. Awaked to the fact that he was in the cold, damp clutch of the faceless flutterers, 
Carter remembered the password of the ghouls and glibbered it as loudly as he could amidst the wind and chaos of flight. Mindless though night gaunts are said to be, the effect was instantaneous, for all tickling stopped at once, and the creatures hastened to shift their captive to a more comfortable position. Thus encouraged, Carter ventured some explanations, telling of the seizure and torture of three ghouls by the moon beasts, and of the need of assembling a party to rescue them. The night gaunts, though inarticulate, seemed to understand what was said, and showed greater haste and purpose in their flight. Suddenly the dense blackness gave place to the gray twilight of inner earth, and there opened up ahead one of those flat, sterile plains on which ghouls loved to squat and gnaw. Scattered tombstones and osseous fragments told of the denizens of that place, and as Carter gave a loud meep of urgent summons, a score of burrows emptied forth their leathery, dog-like tenants. The night gaunts now flew low and set their passenger upon his feet, afterward withdrawing a little and forming a hunched semicircle on the ground while the ghouls greeted the newcomer. Carter glibbered his message rapidly and explicitly to the grotesque company, and four of them at once departed through different burrows to spread the news to others and gather such troops as might be available for a rescue. After a long wait, a ghoul of some importance appeared and made significant signs to the night gaunts, causing two of the latter to fly off into the dark. Thereafter, there were constant accessions to the hunched flock of night gaunts on the plain, till at length the slimy soil was fairly black with them. Meanwhile, fresh ghouls crawled out of the burrows one by one, all glibbering excitedly and forming in crude battle array not far from the huddled night gaunts. In time, there appeared that proud and influential ghoul which was once the artist Richard Pickman of Boston and to him Carter glibbered a very full account of what had occurred. The erstwhile Pickman, pleased to greet his ancient friend again, seemed very much impressed, and held a conference with other chiefs a little apart from the growing throng. Finally, after scanning the ranks with care, the assembled chiefs all meeped in unison, and began glibbering orders to the crowds of ghouls and night gaunts. A large detachment of the horned flyers vanished at once, while the rest grouped themselves two by two on their knees with extended forelegs, awaiting the approach of the ghouls one by one. As each ghoul reached the pair of night gods to which he was assigned, he was taken up and borne away into the blackness, till at last the whole throng had vanished save for Carter, Pickman, and the other chiefs, and a few pairs of night gaunts. Pickman explained that night gaunts are the advance guard and battle steeds of the ghouls, and that the army was issuing forth to Sarcoman to deal with the moon beasts. Then Carter and the ghoulish chiefs approached the waiting bearers and were taken up by the damp, slippery paws. Another moment, and all were whirling in wind and darkness, endlessly up, up, up to the gate of the winged and the special ruins of primal Sarcomand. When, after a great interval, Carter saw again the sickly light of Sarcomand's nocturnal sky, it was to behold the great central plaza swarming with militant ghouls and night gods. Day, he felt sure, must be almost due. But so strong was the army that no surprise of the enemy would be needed. The greenish flare near the wharves still glimmered faintly, though the absence of ghoulish meeping showed that the torture of the prisoners was over for the nonce. Softly glimmering directions to their steeds and to the flock of riderless night gaunts ahead, the ghouls presently rose in wide, whirring columns and swept on over the bleak ruins toward the evil flame. 
Carter was now beside Pickman in the front rank of ghouls and saw as they approached the noisome camp that the moon beasts were totally unprepared. The three prisoners lay bound and inert beside the fire while their toad-like captors slumped drowsily about in no certain order. The almost human slaves were asleep, even the sentinels shirking a duty which in this realm must have seemed to them merely perfunctory. The final swoop of the night gaunts and mounted ghouls was very sudden. Each of the grayish toad-like blasphemies and their almost human slaves being seized by a group of night gaunts before a sound was made. The moon beasts, of course, were voiceless, and even the slaves had little chance to scream before rubbery paws choked them into silence. Horrible were the writhings of those great jellyfish abnormalities as the sardonic night gaunts clutched them, but nothing availed against the strength of those black prehensile talons. When a moon beast writhed too violently, a night gaunt would seize and pull its quivering pink tentacles which seemed to hurt so much that the victim would cease its struggles. Carter expected to see much slaughter, but found that the ghouls were far subtler in their plans. They glibbered certain simple orders to the night gaunts which held the captives, trusting the rest to instinct, and soon the hapless creatures were borne silently away into the great abyss to be distributed impartially amongst the doles. Gugs, ghasts, and other dwellers in darkness whose modes of nourishment are not painless to their chosen victims. Meanwhile, the three bound ghouls had been released and consoled by their conquering kinsfolk, whilst various parties searched the neighborhood for possible remaining moon beasts and boarded the evil smelling black galley at the wharf to make sure that nothing had escaped the general defeat. Surely enough, the capture had been thorough, for not a sign of further life could the victors detect. Carter, anxious to preserve a means of access to the rest of Dreamland, urged them not to sink the anchored galley and this request was freely granted out of gratitude for his act in reporting the plight of the captured trio. On the ship were found some very curious objects and decorations, some of which Carter cast at once into the sea. Ghouls and night gaunts now formed themselves in separate groups, the former questioning their rescued fellow about past happenings. It appeared that the three had followed Carter's directions and proceeded from the enchanted wood to Dilathleen by way of Nier and the skin, stealing human clothes at a lonely farmhouse and loping as closely as possible in the fashion of a man's walk. In Dilathleen's taverns their grotesque ways and faces had aroused much comment, but they had persisted in asking the way to Sarcomand until at last an old traveler was able to tell them. Then they knew that only a ship for Lila Glang would serve their purpose and prepared to wait patiently for such a vessel. But evil spies had doubtless reported much, for shortly after a black galley put into port and the wide-mouthed ruby merchants invited the ghouls to drink with them in a tavern. Wine was produced from one of those sinister bottles grotesquely carven from a single ruby, and after that the ghouls found themselves prisoners on the black galley as Carter had found himself. This time, however, the unseen aurors steered not for the moon but for antique sarcomand, bent evidently on taking their captors before the high priest not to be described. They had touched at the jagged rock in the northern sea which Inquinox mariners shun, and the ghouls had there seen for the first time the red masters of the ship, being sickened despite their own callousness by such extremes of malign shapelessness and fearsome odor. There too were witnessed the nameless pastimes of the toad-like resident garrison, such pastimes as give rise to the night howlings which men fear. 
After that had come the landing at ruined Sarcomand and the beginning of the tortures whose continuance the present rescue had prevented. Future plans were next discussed, the three rescued ghouls suggesting a raid on the jagged rock and the extermination of the toad-like garrison there. To this, however, the night gaunts objected, since the prospect of flying over water did not please them. Most of the ghouls favored the design, but were at a loss how to follow it without the help of the winged night gaunts. Thereupon Carter, seeing that they could not navigate the anchored galley, offered to teach them the use of the great banks of oars, to which proposal they eagerly assented. Gray day had now come, and under that leaden northern sky a picked detachment of ghouls filed into the noisome ship and took their seats on the rowers' benches. Carter found them fairly apt at learning, and before night had risked several experimental trips around the harbor. Not till three days later, however, did he deem it safe to attempt the voyage of conquest. Then the rowers trained, and the night gone safely stowed in the forecastle. The party set sail at last. Pickman and the other chiefs gathering on deck and discussing models of approach and procedure. On the very first night the howlings from the rock were heard. Such was their timber that all the galley's crew shook visibly, but most of all trembled the three rescued ghouls who knew precisely what those howlings meant. It was not thought best to attempt an attack by night, so the ship lay too under the phosphorescent clouds to wait for the dawn of a grayish day. When the light was ample and the howling still, the roars resumed their strokes, and the galley drew closer and closer to that jagged rock whose granite pinnacles clawed fantastically at the dull sky. The sides of the rock were very steep, but on ledges here and there could be seen the bulging walls of queer windowless dwellings and the low railings guarding traveled high roads. No ship of men had ever come so near the place, or at least had never come so near, and departed again. But Carter and the ghouls were void of fear and kept inflexibly on, rounding the eastern face of the rock and seeking the wharves which the rescue trio described as being on the southern side within a harbor formed of steep headlands. The headlands were prolongations of the island proper, and came so closely together that only one ship at a time might pass between them. There seemed to be no watchers on the outside, so the galley was steered boldly through the flume-like strait and into the stagnant putrid harbor beyond. Here, however, all was bustle and activity, with several ships lying at anchor along a forbidding stone quay and scores of almost human slaves and moon beasts by the waterfront, handling crates and boxes or driving nameless and fabulous horrors hitched to lumbering lorries. There was a small stone town hewn out of the vertical cliff above the wharves, with the start of a winding road that spiraled out of sight toward higher ledges of the rock. Of what lay inside that prodigious peak of granite none might say, but the things one saw on the outside were far from encouraging. At sight of the incoming galley the crowds on the wharves displayed much eagerness, those with eyes staring intently and those without eyes wriggling their pink tentacles expectantly. They did not, of course, realize that the black ship had changed hands for ghouls look much like the horned that hooved almost humans, and the night gods were all out of sight below. By this time the leaders had fully formed a plan, which was to loose the night gods as soon as the wharf was touched, and then to sail directly away, leaving matters wholly to the instincts of those almost mindless creatures. Marooned on the rock, the horned flyers would first of all seize whatever living things they found there, and afterward, quite helpless to think except in terms of the homing instinct, 
would forget their fears of water and fly swiftly back to the abyss, burying their noisome prey to appropriate destinations in the dark from which not much would emerge alive. The ghoul that was Pikmin now went below and gave the night gaunts their simple instructions, while the ship drew very near to the ominous and malodorous wharves. Presently a fresh stir rose along the waterfront, and Carter saw that the motions of the galley had begun to excite suspicion. Evidently the steersman was not making for the right dock, and probably the watchers had noticed the difference between the hideous ghouls and the almost human slaves whose places they were taking. Some silent alarm must have been given, for almost at once a horde of the mephitic moon beasts began to pour from the little black doorways of the windowless houses and down the winding road at the right. A rain of curious javelins struck the galley as the prow hit the wharf, felling two ghouls and slightly wounding another, but at this point all the hatches were thrown open to emit a black cloud of whirring night gaunts which swarmed over the town like a flock of horned encyclopean bats. The jellyish moon beasts had procured a great pole and were trying to push off the invading ship, but when the night gaunts struck them they thought of such things no more. It was a very terrible spectacle to see those faceless and rubbery ticklers at their pastime, and tremendously impressive to watch the dense cloud of them spreading through the town and up the winding roadway to the reaches above. Sometimes a group of the black flutterers would drop a toad-like prisoner from aloft by mistake, and the manner in which the victim would burst was highly offensive to the sight and smell. When the last of the night gaunts had left the galley, the ghoulish leaders glibbered an order of withdrawal, and the rowers pulled quietly out of the harbor between the gray headlands, while still the town was a chaos of battle and conquest. The Pikmin ghoul allowed several hours for the night gaunts to make up their rudimentary minds and overcome their fear of flying over the sea, and kept the galley standing about a mile off the jagged rock while he waited and dressed the wounds of the injured men. Night fell, and the gray twilight gave place to the sickly phosphorescence of low clouds and all the while the leaders watched the high peaks of that accursed rock for signs of the night gaunt's flight. Toward morning a black speck was seen hovering timidly over the topmost pinnacle, and shortly afterward the speck had become a swarm. Just before daybreak the swarm seemed to scatter, and within a quarter of an hour it had vanished wholly in the distance toward the northeast. Once or twice something seemed to fall from the thing's swarm into the sea, but Carter did not worry, since he knew from observation that the toad-like moon beasts cannot swim. At length, when the ghouls were satisfied that all the night gaunts had left for Sarcomand and the great abyss with their doomed burdens, the galley put back into the harbor betwixt the gray headlands and all the hideous company landed and roamed curiously over the denuded rock with its towers and eyries and fortresses chiseled from the solid stone. Frightful were the secrets uncovered in those evil and windowless crypts, for the remnants of unfinished pastimes were many, and in various stages of departure from their primal state. Carter put out of the way certain things which were, after a fashion, alive, and fled precipitately from a few other things about which he could not be very positive. The stench-filled houses were furnished mostly with grotesque stools and benches carven from moon trees, and were painted inside with nameless and frantic designs. Countless weapons, implements, and ornaments lay about, 
including some large idols of solid ruby depicting singular beings not found on the earth. These latter did not, despite their material, invite either appropriation or long inspection, and Carter took the trouble to hammer five of them into very small pieces. The scattered spears and javelins he collected and with Pickman's approval distributed among the ghouls. Such devices were new to the dog-like lopers, but their relative simplicity made them easy to master after a few concise hints. The upper parts of the rock held more temples than private homes, and in numerous hewn chambers were found terrible carven altars and doubtfully stained fonts and shrines for the worship of things more monstrous than the wild god the top Kadath. From the rear of one great temple stretched a low black passage which Carter followed far into the rock with a torch till he came to a lightless domed hall of vast proportions whose vaultings were covered with demoniac carvings and in whose center yawned a foul and bottomless well like that in the hideous monastery of Leng where broods alone the high priest not to be described. On the distant shadowy side beyond the noisome well, he thought he discerned a small door of strangely wrought bronze, but for some reason he felt an unaccountable dread of opening it or even approaching it, and hastened back through the cavern to his unlovely allies as they shambled about with an ease and abandon he could scarcely feel. The ghouls had observed the unfinished pastimes of the moon beasts and had profited in their fashion. They had also found a hogshead of potent moon wine and were rolling it down to the wharves for removal and later use in diplomatic dealings, though the rescued trio, remembering its effect on them in Dila Athleen, had warned their company to taste none of it. Of rubies from lunar mines there was a great store, both rough and polished, in one of the vaults near the water. But when the ghouls found they were not good to eat, they lost all interest in them. Carter did not try to carry any away, since he knew too much about those which had mined them. Suddenly there came an excited meeping from the sentries on the wharves, and all the loathsome foragers turned from their tasks to stare seaward and cluster round the waterfront. Betwixt the grey headlands a fresh black galley was rapidly advancing, and it would be but a moment before the almost humans on deck would perceive the invasion of the town and give the alarm to the monstrous things below. Fortunately, the ghouls still bore the spears and javelins which Carter had distributed amongst them, and at his command, sustained by the being that was Pickman, they now formed a line of battle and prepared to prevent the landing of the ship. Presently, a burst of excitement on the galley told of the crew's discovery of the changed state of things and the instant stoppage of the vessel proved that the superior numbers of the ghouls had been noted and taken into account. After a moment of hesitation, the newcomers silently turned and passed out between the headlands again, but not for an instant did the ghouls imagine that the conflict was averted. Either the dark ship would seek reinforcements, or the crew would try to land elsewhere on the island. Hence a party of scouts was at once sent up toward the pinnacle to see what the enemy's course would be. In a very few minutes the ghoul returned breathless to say that the moon beasts and almost humans were landing on the outside of the more easterly of the rugged grey headlands, and ascending by hidden paths and ledges which a goat could scarcely tread in safety. Almost immediately afterward the galley was sighted again through the flume-like strait, but only for a second. Then a few moments later a second messenger panted down from aloft to say that another party was landing on the other headland, both being much more numerous than the size of the galley would seem to allow for. The ship itself, moving slowly with only one sparsely manned tier of oars, soon hove in sight betwixt the cliffs, and lay to in the fetid harbour as if to watch the coming fray 
and stand by for any possible use. By this time, Carter and Pickman had divided the ghouls into three parties, one to meet each of the two invading columns and one to remain in the town. The first two at once scrambled up the rocks in their respective directions, while the third was subdivided into a land party and a sea party. The sea party, commanded by Carter, boarded the anchored galley and rowed out to meet the undermanned galley of the newcomers, whereat the latter retreated through the strait to the open sea. Carter did not at once pursue it, for he knew he might be needed more acutely near the town. Meanwhile, the frightful detachments of the moon beasts and almost humans had lumbered up to the top of the headlands and were shockingly silhouetted on either side against the grey twilight sky. The thin, hellish flutes of the invaders had now begun to whine, and the general effect of those hybrid, half-amorphous processions was as nauseating as the actual odor given off by the toad-like lunar blasphemies. Then the two parties of the ghouls swarmed into sight and joined the silhouetted panorama. Javelins began to fly from both sides, and the swelling meeps of the ghouls and the bestial howls of the almost humans gradually joined the hellish whine of the flutes to form a frantic and indescribable chaos of demon cacophony. Now and then bodies fell from the narrow ridges of the headlands into the sea outside or the harbor inside, in the latter case being sucked quickly under by certain submarine lurkers whose presence was indicated only by prodigious bubbles. For half an hour this dual battle raged in the sky, till upon the west cliff the invaders were completely annihilated. On the east cliff, however, where the leader of the moon beast party appeared to be present, the ghouls had not fared so well, and were slowly retreating to the slopes of the pinnacle proper. Pickman had quickly ordered reinforcements for this front from the party in the town, and these had helped greatly in the earlier stages of the combat. Then, when the western battle was over, the victorious survivors hastened across to the aid of their hard-pressed fellows, turning the tide and forcing the invaders back again along the narrow ridge of the headland. The almost humans were by this time all slain, but the last of the toad-like horrors fought desperately with the great spears clutched in their powerful and disgusting paws. The time for javelins was now nearly past, and the fight became a hand-to-hand -hand contest of what few spearsmen could meet upon that narrow ridge. End of Part 8 Section 9 of The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath by Howard Phillips Lovecraft. This Legamus recording may be distributed and adapted freely for any purpose. Read by Martin Rato. Part 9. As fury and recklessness increased, the number falling into the sea became very great. Those striking the harbor met nameless extinction from the unseen bubblers. But of those striking the open sea, some were able to swim to the foot of the cliffs and land on tidal rocks, while the hovering galley of the enemy rescued several moon beasts. The cliffs were unscalable except where the monsters had debarked so that none of the ghouls on the rocks could rejoin their battle line. Some were killed by javelins from the hostile galley or from the moon beasts above, but a few survived to be rescued. When the security of the land party seemed assured, Carter's galley sallied forth between the headlands and drove the hostile ship far out to sea. 
pausing to rescue such ghouls as were on the rocks or still swimming in the ocean. Several moon beasts washed on rocks or reefs were speedily put out of the way. Finally, the moon beast galley being safely in the distance and the invading land army concentrated in one place, Carter landed a considerable force on the eastern headland in the enemy's rear, after which the fight was short-lived indeed. Attacked from both sides, the noisome flounderers were rapidly cut to pieces or pushed into the sea, till by evening the ghoulish chiefs agreed that the island was again clear of them. The hostile galley, meanwhile, had disappeared, and it was decided that the evil jagged rock had better be evacuated before any overwhelming horde of lunar horrors might be assembled and brought against the victors. So by night, Pickman and Carter assembled all the ghouls and counted them with care, finding that over a fourth had been lost in the day's battles. The wounded were placed on bunks in the galley, for Pickman always discouraged the old ghoulish custom of killing and eating one's own wounded, and the able-bodied troops were assigned to the oars or to such other places as they might most usefully fill. Under the low phosphorescent clouds of night the galley sailed, and Carter was not sorry to be departing from the island of unwholesome secrets, whose lightless domed hall with its bottomless well and repellent bronze door lingered restlessly in his fancy. Dawn found the ship in sight of Sarcoman's ruined keys of basalt, where a few night-gone sentries still waited, squatting like black horned gargoyles on the broken columns and crumbling sphinxes of that fearful city which lived and died before the years of man. The ghouls made camp amongst the fallen stones of Sarcomand, dispatching a messenger for enough night gods to serve them as steeds. Pickman and the other chiefs were effusive in their gratitude for the aid Carter had lent them. Carter now began to feel that his plans were indeed maturing well, and that he would be able to command the help of these fearsome allies, not only in quitting this part of dreamland, but in pursuing his ultimate quest for the god, the top unknown Kadath, and the marvelous sunset city they so strangely withheld from his slumbers. Accordingly, he spoke of these things to the ghoulish leaders, telling what he knew of the cold waste wherein Kadath stands, and of the monstrous Shantax and the mountains carven into double-headed images which guard it. He spoke of the fear of Shantax for night gods, and of how the vast hippocephalic birds fly screaming from the black burrows high up on the gaunt gray peaks that divide Inquinog from hateful Lang. He spoke, too, of the things he'd learned concerning night gods from the frescoes in the windowless monastery of the high priest not to be described, how even the great ones fear them, and how their ruler is not the crawling chaos Nyarlathotep at all, but hoary and immemorial Nodens, lord of the great abyss. All these things Carter glibbered to the assembled ghouls, and presently outlined that request which he had in mind, and which he did not think extravagant, considering the services he had so lately rendered the rubbery dog-like lopers. He wished very much, he said, for the services of enough night gods to bear him safely through the aft, past the realm of Shantax and Carven Mountains, and up into the old waste beyond the returning tracks of any other mortal. He desired to fly to the onyx castle atop unknown Kadath in the cold waste, to plead with the great ones for the sunset city they denied him, and felt sure that the night gods could take him thither without trouble. High above the perils of the plain and over the hideous double heads of those carven sentinels that squat eternally in the gray dusk. For the horned and faceless creatures there could be no danger from aught of earth, since the great ones themselves dread them. 
And even were unexpected things to come from the other gods, who are prone to oversee the affairs of Earth's milder gods, the night gods need not fear, for the outer hells are indifferent matters to such silent and slippery flyers as own not Nyarlathotep for their master, but bow only to potent and archaic nodens. A flock of ten or fifteen night gods, Carter glibbered, would surely be enough to keep any combination of Shantax at a distance, though perhaps it might be well to have some ghouls in the party to manage the creatures, their ways being better known to their ghoulish allies than to men. The party could land him at some convenient point within whatever walls that fabulous onyx citadel might have, waiting in the shadows for his return or his signal whilst he ventured inside the castle to give prayer to the gods of earth. If any ghouls chose to escort him into the throne room of the great ones, he would be thankful, for their presence would add weight and importance to his plea. He would not, however, insist upon this, but merely wish transportation to and from the castle atop unknown Kadath, the final journey being either to the marvelous sunset city itself, in case the gods proved favorable, or back to the earthward gate of deeper slumber in the enchanted wood, in case his prayers were fruitless. Whilst Carter was speaking, all the ghouls listened with great attention, and as the moments advanced, the sky became black with clouds of those night gaunts for which messengers had been sent. The winged steeds settled in a semicircle around the ghoulish army, waiting respectfully as the dog-like chieftains considered the wish of the earthly traveler. The ghoul that was Pickman glibbered gravely with his fellows, and in the end Carter was offered far more than he had at most expected. As he had aided the ghouls in their conquest of the moon beasts, so would they aid him in his daring voyage to realms whence none had ever returned, lending him not merely a few of their allied night gaunts, but their entire army as then encamped, veteran fighting ghouls and newly assembled night gaunts alike, save only a small garrison for the captured black galley and such spoils as had come from the jagged rock in the sea. They would set out through the aft whenever he might wish, and once arrived on Kadath, a suitable train of ghouls would attend him in state as he placed his petition before Earth's gods in their onyx castle. Moved by a gratitude and satisfaction beyond words, Carter made plans with the ghoulish leaders for his audacious voyage. The army would fly high, they decided, over hideous Lang with its nameless monastery and wicked stone villages, stopping only at the vast gray peaks to confer with the Shantak frightening night gaunts whose burrows honeycombed their summits. They would then, according to what advice they might receive from those denizens, choose their final course, approaching unknown Kadath either through the desert of Carbon Mountains north of Inquinoc or through the more northerly reaches of repulsive Ling itself. Dog-like and soulless as they were, the ghouls and night gaunts had no dread of what those untrodden deserts might reveal, nor did they feel any deterring awe at the thought of Kadath towering lone with its onyx castle of mystery. About midday the ghouls and night gods prepared for flight, each ghoul selecting a suitable pair of horned steeds to bear him. Carter was placed well up toward the head of the column beside Pickman, and in front of the hole a double line of riderless night gods was provided as a vanguard. At a brisk leap from Pickman, the whole shocking army rose in a nightmare cloud above the broken columns and crumbling sphinxes of primordial sarcomand, higher and higher till even the great basalt cliff behind the town was cleared, 
and the cold, sterile tableland of Lang's outskirts laid open to sight. Still higher flew the black host, till even this tableland grew small beneath them, and as they worked northward over the windswept plateau of horror, Carter saw once again with a shudder the circle of crude monoliths and the squat windowless building which he knew held that frightful silken mask blasphemy from whose clutches he had so narrowly escaped. This time no descent was made as the army swept bat-like over the sterile landscape, passing the feeble fires of the unwholesome stone villages at a great altitude, and pausing not at all to mark the morbid twistings of the hooved, horned, almost humans that dance and pipe eternally therein. Once they saw a shantak bird flying low over the plain, but when it saw them it screamed noxiously and flapped off to the north in grotesque panic. At dusk they reached the jagged gray peaks that formed the barrier of Inquinoch, and hovered about these strange caves near the summits which Carter recalled as so frightful to the Shantaks. At the insistent meeping of the ghoulish leaders there issued forth from each lofty burrow a stream of horned black flyers with which the ghouls and night gods of the party conferred at length by means of ugly gestures. It soon became clear that the best course would be that over the cold waste north of Inquinoc, for Lang's northward reaches are full of unseen pitfalls that even the night gaunts dislike, abysmal influences centering in certain white hemispherical buildings on curious knolls, which common folklore associates unpleasantly with the other gods and their crawling chaos near Lithota. Of Kadath the flutterers of the peaks knew almost nothing, save that there must be some mighty marvel toward the north, over which the Shantaks and the Carbon Mountains stand guard. They hinted at rumored abnormalities of proportion in those trackless leagues beyond, and recalled vague whispers of a realm where night broods eternally. But of definite data they had nothing to give. So Carter and his party thanked them kindly, and crossing the topmost granite pinnacles to the skies of Inquinoc, dropped below the level of the phosphorescent night clouds and beheld in the distance those terrible squatting gargles that were mountains till some titan hand carved fright into their virgin rock. There they squatted in a hellish half-circle, their legs on the desert sand and their mitres piercing the luminous clouds, sinister, wolf-like, and double-headed, with faces of fury and right hands raised, dully and malignly watching the rim of man's world, and guarding with horror the reaches of a cold northern world which is not man's. From their hideous laps rose evil shantaks of elephantine bulk, but these all fled with insane titters as the vanguard of night gaunts was sighted in the misty sky. Northward above those gargoyle mountains the army flew, and over leagues of dim desert where never a landmark rose. Less and less luminous grew the clouds, till at length Carter could see only blackness around him, but never did the winged steeds falter, bred as they were in earth's blackest crypts, and seeing not with any eyes but with the whole dank surface of their slippery forms. On and on they flew, past winds of dubious scent and sounds of dubious import. Ever in thickest darkness and covering such prodigious spaces that Carter wondered whether or not they could still be within Earth's dreamland. Then suddenly the clouds thinned and the stars shone spectrally above. All below was still black, but those pallid beacons in the sky seemed alive with a meaning and directiveness they had never possessed elsewhere. 
It was not that the figures of the constellations were different, but that the same familiar shapes now revealed the significance they had formerly failed to make plain. Everything focused toward the north. Every curve and asterism of the glittering sky became part of a vast design whose function was to hurry first the eye and then the whole observer onward toward some secret and terrible goal of convergence beyond the frozen waste that stretched endlessly ahead. Carter looked toward the east where the great ridge of barrier peaks had towered along all the length of Inquinoc and saw against the stars a jagged silhouette which told of its continued presence. It was more broken now, with yawning clefts and fantastically erratic pinnacles, and Carter studied closely the suggestive turnings and inclinations of that grotesque outline which seemed to share with the stars some subtle northward urge. They were flying past at a tremendous speed, so that the watcher had to strain hard to catch details, when all at once he beheld just above the line of the topmost peaks a dark and moving object against the stars, whose course exactly paralleled that of his own bizarre party. The ghouls had likewise glimpsed it, for he heard their low glibbering all about him, and for a moment he fancied the object was a gigantic shantack, of a size vastly greater than that of the average specimen. Soon, however, he saw that this theory would not hold, for the shape of the thing above the mountains was not that of any hippocephalic bird. Its outline against the stars, necessarily vague as it was, seemed rather some huge mitred head or pair of heads infinitely magnified and its rapid bobbing flight through the sky seemed most peculiarly a wingless one. Carter could not tell which side of the mountains it was on, but soon perceived that it had parts below the parts he'd first seen, since it blotted out all the stars in places where the ridge was deeply cleft. Then came a wide gap in the range where the hideous reaches of transmontane lang were joined to the cold waste on this side by a low pass through which the stars shone wanly. Carter watched the gap with intense care, knowing that he might see outlined against the sky beyond it the lower parts of the vast thing that flew undulantly above the pinnacles. The object had now floated ahead a trifle, and every eye of the party was fixed on the rift where it would presently appear in full-length silhouette. Gradually the huge thing above the peaks neared the gap, slightly slackening its speed as if conscious of having outdistanced the ghoulish army. For another minute suspense was keen, and then the brief instant of full silhouette and revelation came, bringing to the lips of the ghouls an odd and half-choked meep of cosmic fear, and to the soul of the traveler a chill that never wholly left it. For the mammoth bobbing shape that overtopped the ridge was only a head, a mitred double head and below it in terrible vastness loped the frightful swollen body that bore it, the mountain-high monstrosity that walked in stealth and silence, the hyena-like distortion of a great anthropoid shape that trotted blackly against the sky, its repulsive pair of cone-capped heads reaching halfway to the zenith. Arthur did not lose consciousness or even scream aloud, for he was an old dreamer, but he looked behind him in horror and shuddered when he saw that there were other monstrous heads silhouetted above the level of the peaks, bobbing along stealthily after the first one. And straight in the rear were three of the mighty mountain shapes seen full against the southern stars, tiptoeing wolf-like and lumberingly, their tall mitres nodding thousands of feet in the aft. The carven mountains then had not stayed squatting in that rigid semicircle north of Inquinoc, 
with right hands uplifted. They had duties to perform and were not remiss. But it was horrible that they never spoke and never even made a sound in walking. Meanwhile, the ghoul that was Pikmin had glibbered an order to the night gaunts, and the whole army soared higher into the air. Up toward the stars the grotesque column shot till nothing stood out any longer against the sky, neither the gray granite ridge that was still nor the carven mitered mountains that walked. All was blackness beneath as the fluttering legions surged northward amidst rushing winds and invisible laughter in the ether, and never a shantak or less mentionable entity rose from the haunted wastes to pursue them. The farther they went, the faster they flew, till soon their dizzying speed seemed to pass that of a rifle ball and approach that of a planet in its orbit. Carter wondered how with such speed the earth could still stretch beneath them, but knew that in the land of dream dimensions have strange properties. That they were in a realm of eternal night he felt certain, and he fancied that the constellations overhead had subtly emphasized their northward focus, gathering themselves up, as it were, to cast the flying army into the void of the boreal pole as the folds of a bag are gathered up to cast out the last bits of substance therein. Then he noticed with terror that the wings of the night gods were not flapping any more. The horned and faceless steeds had folded their membranous appendages and were resting quite passive in the chaos of wind that whirled and chuckled as it bore them on. A force not of earth had seized on the army, and ghouls and night gaunts alike were powerless before a current which pulled madly and relentlessly into the north, whence no mortal had ever returned. At length a lone pallid light was seen on the skyline ahead, thereafter rising steadily as they approached, and having beneath it a black mass that blotted out the stars. Carter saw that it must be some beacon on a mountain, for only a mountain could rise so vast as seen from so prodigious a height in the air. Higher and higher rose the light and the blackness beneath it, till all the northern sky was obscured by the rugged conical mass. Lofty as the army was, that pale and sinister beacon rose above it, towering monstrous over all peaks and concernments of earth, and tasting the atomless ether where the cryptical moon and the mad planets reel. No mountain known of man was that which loomed before them. The high clouds far below were but a fringe for its foothills. The groping dizziness of topmost air was but a girdle for its loins. Scornful and spectral climbed that bridge betwixt earth and heaven. Black and eternal night and crowned with a shent of unknown stars whose awful and significant outline grew every moment clearer. Ghouls meeped in wonder as they saw it, and Carter shivered in fear lest all the hurtling army be dashed to pieces on the unyielding onyx of that cyclopean cliff. Higher and higher rose the light, till it mingled with the loftiest orbs of the zenith and winked down at the flyers with lurid mockery. All the north beneath it was blackness now, dread, stony blackness from infinite depths to infinite heights, with only that pale, winking beacon perched unreachably at the top of all vision. Carter studied the light more closely and saw at last what lines its inky background made against the stars. There were towers on that titan mountaintop, horrible domed towers and noxious and incalculable tears and clusters beyond any dreamable workmanship of man, battlements and terraces of wonder and menace, all limbed, tiny and black and distant against the starry shent that glowed malevolently at the uppermost rim of sight. 
Capping that most measureless of mountains was a castle beyond all mortal thought, and in it glowed the demon light. Then Randolph Carter knew that his quest was done, and that he saw above him the goal of all forbidden steps and audacious visions, the fabulous, the incredible home of the Great Ones atop unknown Kadath. Even as he realized this thing, Carter noticed a change in the course of the helplessly wind-sucked party. They were rising abruptly now, and it was plain that the focus of their flight was the onyx castle where the pale light shone. So close was the great black mountain that its sides sped by them dizzily as they shot upward, and in the darkness they could discern nothing upon it. Vaster and vaster loomed the tenebrous towers of the knighted castle above, and Carter could see that it was well-nigh blasphemous in its immensity. Well might its stones have been quarried by nameless workmen in that horrible gulf rent out of the rock in the hill pass north of Inquinoch, for such was its size that a man on its threshold stood even as air out on the steps of earth's loftiest fortress. The pshent of unknown stars above the myriad dome turrets glowed with a sallow, sickly flare, so that a kind of twilight hung about the murky walls of slippery onyx. The pallid beacon was now seen to be a single shining window high up in one of the loftiest towers, and as the helpless army neared the top of the mountain, Carter thought he detected unpleasant shadows flitting across the feebly luminous expanse. It was a strangely arched window of a design wholly alien to earth. The solid rock now gave place to the giant foundations of the monstrous castle, and it seemed that the speed of the party was somewhat abated. Vast walls shot up, and there was a glimpse of a great gate through which the voyagers were swept. All was night in the Titan courtyard, and then came the deeper blackness of inmost things as a huge arched portal engulfed the column. Vortices of cold wind surged dankly through the sightless labyrinths of onyx, and Carter could never tell what cyclopean stairs and corridors lay silently along the route of his endless aerial twisting. Always upward led the terrible plunge in darkness, and never a sound, touch, or glimpse broke the dense pall of mystery. Large as the army of ghouls and night gaunts was, it was lost in the prodigious voids of that more than earthly castle. And when at last there suddenly dawned around him the lurid light of that single tower room whose lofty window had served as a beacon, it took Carter long to discern the far walls and high distant ceiling, and to realize that he was indeed not again in the boundless air outside. Randolph Carter had hoped to come into the throne room of the Great Ones with poise and dignity, flanked and followed by impressive lines of ghouls in ceremonial order and offering his prayer as a free and potent master among dreamers. He had known that the great ones themselves are not beyond a mortal's power to cope with, and had trusted to luck that the other gods and their crawling chaos, the Arlathotep, would not happen to come to their aid at the crucial moment, as they had so often done before when men sought out earth's gods in their home or on their mountains. And with his hideous escort he'd half hoped to defy even the other gods if need were, knowing as he did that ghouls have no masters and that night gaunts own not Nyarlathotep, but only archaic nodens for their lord. But now he saw that supernal Kadath in its cold waste is indeed girt with dark wonders and nameless sentinels. 
and that the other gods are of a surety vigilant in guarding the mild, feeble gods of earth. Void as they are of lordship over ghouls and night gaunts, the mindless, shapeless blasphemies of outer space can yet control them when they must, so that it was not in state as a free and potent master of dreamers that Randolph Carter came into the great once throne room with his ghouls, swept and herded by nightmare tempests from the stars and dogged by unseen horrors of the northern waste. All that army floated captive and helpless in the lurid light, dropping numbly to the onyx floor when by some voiceless order the winds of fright dissolved. End of Part 9 Section 10 of The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath by Howard Phillips Lovecraft. This Legamus recording may be distributed and adapted freely for any purpose. Read by Martin Rato. Part 10 Before no golden days had Randolph Carter come, nor was there any august circle of crowned and haloed beings with narrowed eyes, long-lobed ears, thin nose, and pointed chin, whose kinship to the carbon face on and granite might stamp them as those to whom a dreamer might pray. Save for the one tower room, the onyx castle atop Kadath was dark, and the masters were not there. Carter had come to unknown Kadath in the cold waste, but he had not found the gods. Yet still the lurid light glowed in that one tower room whose size was so little less than that of all outdoors, and whose distant walls and roof were so nearly lost to sight in thin, curling mists. Earth's gods were not there, it was true, but of subtler and less visible presences there could be no lack. Where the mild gods are absent, the other gods are not unrepresented, and certainly the onyx castle of castles was far from tenantless. In what outrageous form or forms terror would next reveal itself, Carter could by no means imagine. He felt that his visit had been expected, and wondered how close a watch had all along been kept upon him by the crawling chaos Nyarlathotep. It is Nyarlathotep, horror of infinite shapes and dread soul and messenger of the other gods, that the fungus moon beasts serve, and Carter thought of the black galley that had vanished when the tide of battle turned against the toad-like abnormalities on the jagged rock in the sea. Reflecting upon these things, he was staggering to his feet in the midst of his nightmare company, when there rang without warning through that pale, litten, and limitless chamber the hideous blast of a demon trumpet. Three times pealed that frightful, brazen scream, and when the echoes of the third blast had died chucklingly away, Randolph Carter saw that he was alone. Whither, why, and how the ghouls and night gaunts had been snatched from sight was not for him to divine. He knew only that he was suddenly alone, and that whatever unseen powers lurked mockingly around him were no powers of Earth's friendly dreamland. Presently from the chamber's uttermost reaches a new sound came. This, too, was a rhythmic trumpeting, but of a kind far removed from the three raucous blasts which had dissolved his goodly cohorts. In this low fanfare echoed all the wonder and melody of ethereal dream, exotic vistas of unimagined loveliness floating from each strange chord and subtly alien cadence. Odors of incense came to match the golden notes, 
and overhead a great light dawned, its colors changing in cycles unknown to Earth's spectrum, and following the song of the trumpets in weird symphonic harmonies. Torches flared in the distance, and the beat of drums throbbed nearer amidst waves of tense expectancy. Out of the thinning mists and the cloud of strange incenses filed twin columns of giant black slaves with loincloths of iridescent silk. Upon their heads were strapped vast helmet-like torches of glittering metal from which the fragrance of obscure balsams spread out in fumous spirals. In their right hands were crystal wands whose tips were carven into leering chimeras, while their left hands grasped long, thin, silver trumpets which they blew in turn. Armlets and anklets of gold they had, and between each pair of anklets stretched a golden chain that held its wearer to a sober gait. That they were true black men of Earth's dreamland was at once apparent, but it seemed less likely that their rites and costumes were holy things of our Earth. Ten feet from Carter the column stopped, and as they did so each trumpet flew abruptly to its bearer's thick lips. Wild and ecstatic was the blast that followed, and wilder still the cry that chorus just after from dark throat somehow made shrill by strange artifice. Then down the wide lane betwixt the two columns a lone figure strode. A tall, slim figure with the young face of an antique pharaoh, gay with prismatic robes and crowned with a golden scent, that glowed with inherent light. Close up to Carter strode that regal figure, whose proud carriage and smart features had in them the fascination of a dark god or fallen archangel, and around whose eyes there lurked the languid sparkle of capricious humor. It spoke, and in its mellow tones there rippled the wild music of Lethean streams. Randolph Carter, said the voice, you have come to see the great ones whom it is unlawful for men to see. Watchers have spoken of this thing, and the other gods have grunted as they rolled and tumbled mindlessly to the sound of thin flutes in the black ultimate void where broods the demon sultan whose name no lips dare speak aloud. When Barzai the wise climbed Hathek Kia to see the greater ones dance and howl above the clouds and the moonlight, he never returned. The other gods were there, and they did what was expected. Zenig of Aphorat sought to reach unknown Kadath in the cold waste, and his skull is now set in a ring on the little finger of one whom I need not name. But you, Randolph Carter, have braved all things of Earth's dreamland and burned still with the flame of quest. You came not as one curious, but as one seeking his due. Nor have you failed ever in reverence toward the mild gods of Earth. Yet have these gods kept you from the marvelous sunset city of your dreams, and wholly through their own small covetousness, for verily they craved the weird loveliness of that which your fancy had fashioned, and vowed that henceforward no other spot should be their abode. They are gone now from their castle on unknown Kadath to dwell in your marvelous city. All through its palaces of vain marble they revel by day, and when the sun sets, they go out in the perfumed gardens and watch the golden glory on temples and colonnades, arched bridges and silver basin fountains, and wide streets with blossom-laden urns and ivory statues and gleaming rows. And when night comes, they climb tall terraces in the dew and sit on carved benches of porphyry, scanning the stars, or lean over pale balustrades to gaze at the town's steep northward slopes, where one by one the little windows and old peaked gables shine softly out, 
with the calm yellow light of homely candles. The gods love your marvelous city, and walk no more than the ways of the gods. They have forgotten the high places of earth, and the mountains that know their youth. The earth has no longer any gods that are gods, and only the other ones from outer space hold sway on unremembered Kadath. Far away in a valley of your own childhood, Randolph Carter, play the heedless great ones. You have dreamed too well, O oh wise arch-dreamer, for you have drawn dreams' gods away from the world of all men's visions to that which is wholly yours. Having builded out of your boyhood's small fancies a city more lovely than all the phantoms that have gone before, it is not well that earth's gods leave their thrones for the spider to spin on, and their realm for the others to sway in the dark manner of others. Fain would the powers from outside bring chaos and horror to you, Randolph Carter, who are the cause of their upsetting. But that they know it is by you alone that the gods may be sent back to their world. In that half-waking dreamland which is yours, no power of uttermost night may pursue, and only you can send the selfish great ones gently out of your marvelous sunset city, back through the northern twilight to their wonted place atop unknown Kadath in the cold waste. So, Randolph Carter, in the name of the other gods, I spare you and charge you to seek that sunset city which is yours, and to send thence the drowsy truant gods for whom the dream world waits. Not hard to find is that roseal fever of the gods, that fanfare of supernal trumpets and clash of immortal cymbals, that mystery whose place and meaning have haunted you through the halls of waking and the gulfs of dreaming, and tormented you with hints of vanished memory and the pain of lost things awesome and momentous. Not hard to find is that symbol and relic of your days of wonder, for truly it is but the stable and eternal gem wherein all that wonder sparkles crystallized to light your evening path. Behold, it is not over unknown seas, but back over well-known years that your quest must go, back to the bright strange things of infancy and the quick sun-drenched glimpses of magic that old scenes brought to wide young eyes. For know you that your gold and marble city of wonder is only the sum of what you have seen and loved in youth. It is the glory of Boston's hillside roofs and western windows aflame with sunset, of the flower-fragrant common and the great dome on the hill and the tangle of gables and chimneys in the violet valley where the many bridge Charles flows drowsily. These things you saw, Randolph Carter, when your nurse first wheeled you out in the springtime, and they will be the last things you will ever see with eyes of memory and of love. And there is antique Salem with its brooding years and spectral marbleheads scaling its rocky precipices into past centuries. And the glory of Salem's towers and spires seen afar from marblehead's pastures across the harbor against the setting sun. There is Providence, quaint and lordly on its seven hills over the blue harbor, with terraces of green leading up to steeples and citadels of living antiquity, and Newport climbing wraith-like from its dreaming breakwater. Arkham is there, with its moss-grown gambrel roofs and the rocky rolling meadows behind it, and antediluvian Kingsport, hoary with stacked chimneys and deserted keys and overhanging gables, and the marvel of high cliffs and the milky-misted ocean with tolling buoys beyond. 
Cool vales in Concord, cobbled lands in Portsmouth, twilight bends of rustic New Hampshire roads where giant elms half hide white farmhouse walls and creaking well sweeps, Gloucester's salt wharves and Truro's windy willows, vistas of distant steeple towns and hills beyond hills along the North Shore, hushed stony slopes and low ivied cottages in the lee of huge boulders in Rhode Island's back country. Scent of the sea and fragrance of the fields, spell of the dark woods and joy of the orchards and gardens at dawn. These, Randolph Carter, are your city, for they are yourself. New England bore you, and into your soul she poured a liquid loveliness which cannot die. This loveliness, molded, crystallized, and polished by years of memory and dreaming, is your terraced wonder of elusive sunsets. And to find that marble parapet with curious urns and carven rail, and descend at last these endless balustraded steps to the city of broad squares and prismatic fountains, you need only to turn back to the thoughts and visions of your wistful boyhood. Look, through that window shine the stars of eternal night. Even now they're shining above the scenes you've known and cherished, drinking of their charm that they may shine more lovely over the gardens of dream. There is Antares. He is winking at this moment over the roofs of Tremont Street, and you could see him from your window on Beacon Hill. Out beyond those stars yawn the gulfs from whence my mindless masters have sent me. Some day you too may traverse them, but if you are wise you will beware of such folly. For of those mortals who have been and returned, only one preserves a mind unshattered by the pounding, clawing horrors of the void. Terrors and blasphemies gnaw at one another for space, and there is more evil in the lesser ones than in the greater, even as you know from the deeds of those who sought to deliver you into my hands, whilst I myself harbored no wish to shatter you, and would indeed have helped you hither long ago had I not been elsewhere busy, and certain that you would yourself find the way. Shun, then, the outer hells, and stick to the calm, lovely things of your youth. Seek out your marvelous city, and drive thence the recreant great ones, sending them back gently to those scenes which are of their own youth, and which wait uneasy for their return. Easier even than the way of dim memory is the way I will prepare for you, See, there comes hither a monstrous shantak, led by a slave who for your peace of mind had best keep invisible. Mount, and be ready. There, Yogash the Black will help you on the scaly horror. Steer for that brightest star just south of the zenith. It is Vega, and in two hours will be just above the terrace of your sunset city. Steer for it only till you hear a far-off singing in the high ether. Higher than that lurks madness. So rein your shantak when the first note lures. Look then back to earth and you will see shining the deathless altar flame of Ered Na from the sacred roof of a temple. That temple is in your desiderate sunset city, so steer for it before you heed the singing and are lost. When you draw nigh the city, steer for the same high parapet, whence of old you scanned the outspread glory, prodding the shantak till he cry aloud. That cry the great ones will hear and know as they sit on their perfumed terraces, and there will come upon them such a homesickness that all of your city's wonders will not console them for the absence of Kadath's grim castle and the shent of eternal stars that crowns it. Then must you land amongst them with the Shantak and let them see and touch that noisome and hippocephalic bird, 
Meanwhile, discoursing to them of unknown Kadath, which you will so lately have left, and telling them how its boundless halls are lovely and unlighted, where of old they used to leap and revel in supernal radiance. And the Shantak will talk to them in the manner of Shantaks, but it will have no powers of persuasion beyond the recalling of elder days. Over and over you must speak to the wandering great ones of their home and youth, till at last they will weep and ask to be shown the returning path they have forgotten. Thereat can you loose the waiting Shantak, sending him skyward with the homing cry of his kind, hearing which the great ones will prance and jump with antique mirth, and forthwith stride after the loathly bird in the fashion of gods, through the deep gulfs of heaven to Kadath's familiar towers and domes. Then will the marvelous sunset city be yours to cherish and inhabit forever, and once more will earth's gods rule the dreams of men from their accustomed seat. Go now. The casement is open and the stars await outside. Already your shantak wheezes and titters with impatience. Steer for Vega through the night, but turn when the singing sounds. Forget not this warning, lest horrors unthinkable suck you into the gulf of shrieking and olulent madness. Remember the other gods. They are great and mindless and terrible and lurk in the outer voids. They are good gods to shun. Hey, ah, Shantanigi, you are off. Send back Earth's gods to their haunts on unknown Kadath, and pray to all space that you may never meet me in my thousand other forms. Farewell, Randolph Carter, and beware, for I am Nyarlathotep, the crawling chaos. And Randolph Carter, gasping and dizzy on his hideous shantak, shot screamingly into space toward the cold blue glare of Boreal Vega, looking but once behind him at the clustered and chaotic turrets of the onyx nightmare wherein still glowed the lone lurid light of that window above the air and the clouds of Earth's dreamland. Great polypus horrors slid darkly past, and unseen bat wings beat multitudinous around him, but still he clung to the unwholesome mane of that loathly and hippocephalic scaled bird. The stars danced mockingly, almost shifting now and then to form pale signs of doom that one might wonder one had not seen and feared before, and ever the winds of nether howled of vague blackness and loneliness beyond the cosmos. Then through the glittering vault ahead there fell a hush of portent, and all the winds and horrors slunk away as night things slink away before dawn. Trembling in waves that golden wisps of nebula made weirdly visible, there rose a timid hint of far-off melody, droning in faint chords that our own universe of stars knows not. And as that music grew, the Shantak raised its ears and plunged ahead, and Carter likewise bent to catch each lovely strain. It was a song, but not the song of any voice. Night and the spheres sang it, and it was old when space and the Arlathotep and the other gods were born. Faster flew the Shantak, and lower bent the rider, drunk with the marvel of strange gulfs, and whirling in the crystal coils of outer magic. Then came too late the warning of the evil one, the sardonic caution of the demon legate who had bidden the seeker beware the madness of that song. Only to taunt had Nyarlathotep marked out the way to safety in the marvelous sunset city. Only to mock had that black messenger revealed the secret of these truant gods 
whose steps he could easily lead back at will. For madness and the void's wild vengeance are Nyarlathotep's only gifts to the presumptuous, and frantic though the rider strove to turn his disgusting steed, that leering, tittering shantak coursed on impetuous and relentless, flapping its great slippery wings in malignant joy, and headed for those unhallowed pits whither no dreams reach, that last amorphous blight of nethermost confusion, where bubbles and blasphemes at infinity center the mindless demon sultan Azathoth, whose name no lips dare speak aloud. Unswerving and obedient to the foul legate's orders, that hellish bird plunged onward through shoals of shapeless lurkers and caperers in darkness, and vacuous herds of drifting entities that pawed and groped and groped and pawed, the nameless larvae of the other gods that are like them, blind and without mind, and possessed of singular hungers and thirsts. Onward, unswerving and relentless, and tittering hilariously to watch the chuckling and hysterics into which the risen song of night and the spheres had turned, that eldritch scaly monster bore its helpless rider, hurtling and shooting, cleaving the utmost rim and spanning the outermost abysses, leaving behind the stars and the realms of matter, and darting meteor-like through stark formlessness toward those inconceivable unlighted chambers beyond time, wherein Azathoth gnaws shapeless and ravenous amidst the muffled, maddening beat of vile drums and the thin, monotonous whine of accursed flutes. Onward, onward through the screaming, cackling, and blackly populous gulfs, and then from some dim, blessed distance there came an image and a thought to Randolph Carter the doomed. Too well had Nyarlathotep planned his mocking and his tantalizing, for he had brought up that which no gust of icy terror could quite efface. Home, New England, Beacon Hill, the waking world. For know you that your gold and marble city of wonder is only the sum of what you've seen and loved in youth, the glory of Boston's hillside roofs and western windows aflame with sunset, of the flower-fragrant common and the great dome on the hill and the tangle of gables and chimneys in the violet valley where the many bridge Charles flows drowsily. This loveliness, molded, crystallized, and polished by years of memory and dreaming, is your terraced wonder of elusive sunsets. And to find that marble parapet with curious urns and carven rail, and descend at last those endless balustraded steps to the city of broad squares and prismatic fountains, you need only to turn back to the thoughts and visions of your wistful boyhood. Onward, onward, dizzily onward, to ultimate doom through the blackness where sightless feelers pawed and slimy snouts jostled and nameless things tittered and tittered and tittered. But the image and the thought had come, and Randolph Carter knew clearly that he was dreaming and only dreaming and that somewhere in the background the world of waking and the city of his infancy still lay. Words came again. You need only turn back to the thoughts and visions of your wistful boyhood. Turn, turn. Blackness on every side but Randolph Carter could turn. Thick though the rushing nightmare that clutched his senses, Randolph Carter could turn and move. He could move. And if he chose, he could leap off the evil shantak that bore him hurtlingly doomward at the orders of Nyarlathotep. 
He could leap off and dare those depths of night that yawned interminably down, those depths of fear whose terrors yet could not exceed the nameless doom that lurked waiting at chaos's core. He could turn and move and leap. He could. He would. He would. He would. Off that vast hippocephalic abomination leaped the doomed and desperate dreamer, and down through endless voids of sentient blackness he fell. Aeons reeled. Universes died and were born again. Stars became nebulae, and nebulae became stars, and still Randolph Carter fell through those endless voids of sentient blackness. Then in the slow creeping course of eternity the utmost cycle of the cosmos churned itself into another futile completion, and all things became again as they were unreckoned kalpas before. Matter and light were born anew as space once had known them, and comets, suns, and worlds sprang flaming into life. Though nothing survived to tell that they had been and gone, been and gone, always and always, back to no first beginning. And there was a firmament again, and a wind, and a glare of purple light in the eyes of the falling dreamer. There were gods and presences and wills, beauty and evil and the shrieking of noxious night robbed of its prey. For through the unknown ultimate cycle had lived a thought and a vision of a dreamer's boyhood, and now there were remade a waking world and an old cherished city to body and to justify these things. Out of the void, Sngak, the violet gas, had pointed the way, and archaic Nodens was bellowing his guidance from unhinted deeps. Stars swelled to dawns, and dawns burst into fountains of gold, carmine, and purple, and still the dreamer fell. Cries rent the ether as ribbons of light beat back the fiends from outside and hoary Nodens raised a howl of triumph when the Ardathotep, close on his quarry, stopped, baffled by a glare that seared his formless hunting horrors to gray dust. Randolph Carter had indeed descended at last the wide marmorial flights to his marvelous city, for he was come again to the fair New England world that had wrought him. So to the organ chords of morning's myriad whistles, and dawn's blaze thrown dazzling through purple panes by the great gold dome of the state house on the hill, Randolph Carter leaped shoutingly awake within his Boston room. Birds sang in hidden gardens, and the perfume of trellised vines came wistful from arbors his grandfather had reared. Beauty and light glowed from classic mantle and carven cornice and walls grotesquely figured, while a sleek black cat rose yawning from hearthside sleep that his master's start and shriek had disturbed. And vast infinities away, past the gate of deeper slumber and the enchanted wood and the garden lands and the serenarian sea and the twilight reaches of Inquinoc, the crawling chaos the Arlithotep strode brooding into the onyx castle atop unknown Kadath in the cold waste, and taunted insolently the mild gods of earth whom he had snatched abruptly from their scented revels in the marvelous sunset city. End of Part 10 End of the Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath by Howard Phillips Lovecraft